Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. We invite Dr. Ruban Ferreira, President of the Clinical Society of Columbus South Teaching Hospital, to deliver the welcome address. Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you who are joining us with us physically as well as virtually from Columbus South Teaching Hospital. Actually, it is a very great privilege for us to join hands with SLMP as we are a very primitive uh, society still at the start. We are very much privileged to have this joint session and for, thank you very much for the invitation uh, from the Sri Lanka, uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association. Dr. Professor Samad, uh, actually we were waiting to meet you physically. A lot of your colleagues are here. Unfortunately, you are still on the way. We will be uh, joining with you very shortly via Zoom. And thank you very much for your invitation and for your presence via Zoom. Uh, going back to our clinical society, I think if we go back to the start, it was about six years back, we started our so-called academic event as a guest speech, uh, which was held during the annual get together in the evening at Golden Rose. We had this guest lecture for a couple of years and few of us who were keen on adding some academic interest into it, we started having a pre paper session during the uh, dinner dance, which was not a great success because all were interested in enjoying and partying at that time. And it did not work very well during that time. So. I think four years back, we decided to start our annual academic event when Dr. Asel Gunwardhan was here. Uh, this is the fifth time we are having an annual academic session, which is happening next month. Uh, as we all know, being an uh, academic uh, society in the uh, hospital, we wanted to have more academic events. This is our first start for the year, joining hands with Sri Lanka Medical Association. But we have planned few more academic events of uh, variety during the coming year. Once again, going back to this event, I would like to thank all the speakers who have agreed to talk to us today. Professor uh, Nilika Malavadi, Yashoda, Ritma, Sajit, and Hazmi, all my colleagues. Uh, great thank on behalf of the Center Society for all of you all. We'll be talking about, uh, they'll be talking about very relevant events, uh, not directly what we are hearing, but various aspects which we are all waiting to hear related to COVID and respiratory symptoms. Uh, I won't be taking long. We have to start the academic event and keep in time. And I would like to invite from summer to join us virtually and hopefully I think the technology will work good for us. Enjoy the event. Hope we have a fruitful event during the day. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Joining us online, we have Professor Sama Dedarmaratna, President of the Sri Lanka Medical Association. Sir, I cordially invite you to address the gathering. Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you very much, President and the Council of the Columbus South Teaching Hospital Clinical Society. Uh, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and allowing us to collaborate with you at your annual session. So, pleasure is ours actually. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, seriously, sorry that I wasn't able to come there on time. Columbus South. Uh, teaching hospital is the place where I did my internship long, long time back. So I would have really liked to come and meet you all. Now it's very crowded place. Those days, majority of those buildings were not there anyway. So welcome you all to this joint meeting. Hope you enjoy the meeting. And I have to specially thank uh, Dr. Sajid Kudusin, our live wire, he's the uh, assistant treasurer. But he works a lot, and I, this whole uh, meeting was this initiative. And thank you very much, Sajit. Also, hope you enjoy the sessions, and welcome you all. Thank you, Ruan. Thank you, Dr. Over to you. 
Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now arrived at the core of today's program. And I would like to invite Dr. Rwanda Pereira and Dr. Asurka Gunaratna to chair the ensuing session. Good morning, afternoon. We are going to start our first guest lecture of the session today. Uh, Dr. Nidika Malandie does not need any introduction to any of the audience. Actually, COVID and Nidika is a pair. She goes hand in hand. She does not need any introduction. Uh, but she is the head and the professor of the Department of Immunology and Medical Molecular Medicine. She will be speaking to us on a very, very relevant <laughs> topic on the pandemic. I think for all of us who are gathered here and who are joining us virtually, this is our study of questions getting rid of the mask and getting rid of the restrictions that we all are exhausted during the last two years. Nidika is going to invite us. And thank you so much, sir, uh, for the invitation to speak at this collaborative session uh, with the Kalam South uh, Clinical Society and the SLMA. Just try to open the presentation uh, if you give me a few seconds. Yeah. So I think everybody wants to know, as you already said, uh, whether the pandemic will end or is it over or when can we expect it to finish? Uh, so I'm going to talk about where we are now, and of course, how we got here. I think all of you know, but I think it's important just briefly to go how we got here in the first place, what we have achieved and way forward. Now, if you look at how things proceeded from the 2019 uh, December, we initially were infected with this Wuhan variant. So this is the global data of the number of cases. We had Wuhan, uh, then after a while, several countries had the alpha, beta, or the uh, gamma. Uh, so that, that was based on different countries. Then all countries were hit by Delta, and you know what that caused to Sri Lanka. And this is Omicron. So you can see when we look at the number of cases, Omicron, the number of cases with Omicron is nothing compared to all uh, to the number of cases we had collectively till the end of Delta. So now Omicron is here, which is much, much more transmissible than anything we knew. However, fortunately, when it comes to the devastation it causes, Omicron is, as all of you know, and what we experienced in Sri Lanka, it is not as bad as Delta, uh, because it causes milder disease and less hospitalization, less sickle disease and death. Uh, so fortunately, although the number of cases per 100,000 looks like what I showed you, when, it, uh, when you come to the deaths per 100,000, it is much, much less. Of course, uh, and, and you know, things are sort of all right in Sri Lanka, uh, but of course, the number of cases depending on the how you test and the case fatality rate would depend on the number of positive versus number of deaths, and because of uh, how things are done, if the case fatality rate, which I have marked in these arrows, uh, remains high in Sri Lanka compared to other countries. That is because uh, of the number of cases reported versus the deaths and how we test. Now, even though Omicron is causing less severe disease and death, this is not the case in all countries. This is 18th of February, it is last Friday, uh, I believe, the deaths caused by uh, in different countries, and every day, you know, over 1,500, 2,000 die in America, as even these days, after more than two years into the pandemic, so many are still dying in America, and so many are still dying in different countries. And apart from the reported number of deaths, which of course is, is very uh, depends on how you report deaths, the actual mortality is very different. So if you look at the reported number of deaths, 5.5 uh, million people have died of COVID. But when you look at the excess mortality, so how excess mortality is calculated is if you look at the number of deaths in 2017, 2018, 2019, the number of deaths per year, and the number of people died in 2020 and 2021, that is excess deaths. So of all the countries which reported excess deaths, Russia is number one. 
Okay, so the excess deaths reported by Russia cumulatively up to now is 101, 100,000 people. So Russia leads in the excess deaths. So when you look at the excess deaths, the actual number of people that died because of COVID or as a result of COVID is between uh, uh, 20 to 30 million people in the world. So that's a lot, lot of people that COVID has got rid of. And we know how things look in uh, in, the, uh, in India last year during the Delta wave, uh, and they reported 400,000 people dying during that Delta wave. However, the actual number of cases are very different. Uh, so these are just two uh, districts. So the actual number of cases are 35 to 100 times more than what was reported in India. So for instance, if you take this district, uh, uh, read, actually. Uh, so, the, so these are the, uh, the number of deaths. So 1,000, uh, 1,211 was reported in uh, Lucknow, but the actual number of deaths was uh, something much, much more. I can't read my slides, it's, it's too small. So, <laughs> but anyway, you can see that the reported uh, number of deaths and the actual number of deaths are very, very different. But fortunately, over, over the time, things have changed. Uh, we got vaccines, which actually made a huge difference. So if you look at the mortality, uh, infection fatality rates. So this is very different from case fatality rates. Case fatality rates is the number of cases reported versus the num number who died. Infection fatality rates are the number who got infected, which includes in asymptomatic infection versus case, uh, the number who died. So at the beginning of the pandemic, the case fatality rates were over 1%, infection fatality rates were over 1%, but they have gradually declined. And you can see, uh, this gradual declining in infection fatality rates were because of more and more people became COVID antibody positive. And this drastic increase in COVID antibody positivity was because of vaccination and not because of infection. So this is the number of in, uh, individuals positive uh, due to natural infection antibody positivity. This is the number of adults with vaccine-induced antibodies. And you can see as the vaccine-induced antibodies in a population increased, uh, the infection fatality rates have drastically declined. So after two years, uh, we are much better than what we were earlier because the infection fatality rates are very much less. Although I just showed in some countries, uh, there's a lot of deaths actually. And if you take United States, although Delta is much more, much, much more severe than Omicron. Omicron has so far killed many more in America than Delta did. Okay, so a lot of factors actually uh, come in to uh, determine the proportion of people who died. So after in two years, we have a significant proportion of people uh, immunized and uh, boosted, and we have emergence of new variants, which might not necessarily be milder, but anything that replaces Omicron has to be more transmissible. So where do we go from here? So I thought I'll start with the bad news and then end with the good news so that everybody has a, uh, a, a good feeling at the end. Okay, so to start with the bad news. Okay, so now we have got Omicron. Now, the problem with Omicron is, as you can see, so these are all the initial uh, SARS-CoV-2 variants, and this is Omicron. And it is very, very antigenetically different to the previous SARS-CoV-2 variants. And scientists are actually asking this to be called the different virus itself. Now, if you look at dengue, we have dengue 1, 2, 3, 4, which have completely four different viruses and four, four different serotypes. So a definition of a serotype is when the serum of a previous variant doesn't neutralize it. So if we have somebody infected with dengue 1, that person's serum will not completely neutralize dengue 2. So likewise, we have the same situation here. So anybody who was infected with these variants, their serum does not neutralize Omicron. Now, why is this? Now, if we understand how the virus infects cells, the receptor binding domain binds to the ACE2 and gets into the cell. Neutralizing antibodies inhibit this. And if you take Omicron, uh, in the SARS-CoV-2, there are four neutralizing antibody binding sites, four major sites. In Omicron, all four sites are mutated so that neutralizing antibodies cannot bind properly. 
So vaccine-induced neutralizing antibodies or infection-induced neutralizing antibodies are less effective in preventing infection, uh, preventing infection from Omicron. And all these antibody cocktails that were developed for the previous variants, like which were being uh, uh, region program and everything that has been developed, is not effective against Omicron. So all these things are now uh, not working. Uh, but if you come to the virus, of course, virus is not going to be just happy being Omicron and, and doing that. The virus is evolved and of course, it's going to get better. And the main aim of the, of the virus is, of course, to reproduce. So when Omicron causes widespread immunity and infection, then it is something better that is more transmissible than Omicron. So now the original Omicron, or let's say Omicron version 1, because I think people understand it better like that, Omicron version 1 is all because of our BA1. And so it caused devastation, I mean, massive number of cases everywhere in the world that I just showed you. Then we got BA2. And if you look at, compare the transmissibility, so this is the transmissibility of Omicron initial version BA1. And Delta is so much less transmissible than Omicron version 1. This is why Omicron managed to wipe out Delta. We don't have Delta, basically, at least in Colombo. Uh, but if you look at Omicron version 2, which is BA2, that is so much more transmissible than the Omicron version 1. So BA2 is much, much transmissible than BA1, which means that, of course, BA2 gets rid of BA1. Okay, so it's the one that is more transmissible that replaces the other one. So it's transmissibility that matters. So, and when we look at Sri Lankan data, okay, so uh, this is global data, mind you. So, this is Omicron coming up and which is gradually replacing Delta. Only a little bit of Delta is reported everywhere in the world. And this is Omicron version 2 of BA2 emerging. In Denmark, of course, this is uh, Delta, uh, this is Delta that have, has gone. Uh, the blue line is Delta. Omicron version 1, Omicron version 2 emerging, and of course, Omicron version 2 taking off. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka is doing much better than that. So, in, uh, so we got rid of Delta very early in Colombo. Okay, so this is Colombo data. Uh, so yeah, by early February, we are not finding any Delta in Colombo. And the red is the Omicron version 2 or BA2, which is rapidly displacing BA1. You can see the BA1 is rapidly declining with the emergence of BA2. Now, is BA2 a problem apart from the transmissibility? Uh, so there is data about vaccine e efficacy. Uh, so now this is the unvaccinated. Of course, the unvaccinated, when they get infected, they are much more likely to transmit. So this is also a ratio. And of course, much, much more susceptible. Uh, the fully vaccinated, of course, are less susceptible and less tra transmit less when infected with Omicron. Uh, but as you can see, uh, the immunization of BA2 is a, a little bit more than BA1. Okay, so BA2 for Omicron version 2 appears to evade immunity a little bit better than BA1. Uh, this is based on uh, a, a clinical uh, real world data. And in animal models, in hamster models, so I'll just take you through, this is a hamster uh, infection, a lung infection with BA1 versus BA2. So the red dots are viral particles. You can see there is more infection and fusogenicity with BA2. This is the lung HNE staining. This is BA1 versus BA2. With BA2, there is more inflammatory infiltrate coming in. And this is pneumocytes. BA1 versus BA2. So there is more infection with BA2. So based on hamster models, we are doing more infectious, uh, not infectious, more pathogenic. But data coming from South Africa, because South Africa has BA2, uh, real world data does not show that BA2 is more uh, pathogenic or causes more severe disease than BA1. However, it depends on the country. Okay, So this is just Denmark compared to Sri Lanka. Okay. So Denmark, as we know, has got rid of all COVID restrictions. Okay. But this is the death rate per 100,000 in Denmark. So the deaths have drastically increased in Denmark with BA2. And in Sri Lanka, that is not the case. Okay. So I mean, we can argue whether Sri Lankan death statistics are accurate, but we know that is nothing like happened in Delta. 
Okay, so this is what happened with Delta in Sri Lanka. And this is as we are now, I mean, hospitals are not like at all, nothing compared to Delta at all. So, and of course in Denmark, uh, about 60% of the uh, population is boosted. So apart from those things, but what also seems to matter when it comes to mortality, severe disease and all that, is how soon people got infected with the previous COVID uh, variant. And we know that this is what happened in Sri Lanka. We had a really, really bad Delta wave. There are so many got infected, whereas uh, Denmark actually didn't experience it, uh, the Delta like we did. So after experiencing just coming out of a Delta, when VA2 hits us, we are not doing so bad, but Denmark is doing not so good. So you can't have one uh, thing that fits all. So what is going to cover variant is going to hit the country, is going to affect the country, a lot of things matters. Okay, it's not just the virus, there are climatic factors, uh, cost factors, like when how many got naturally infected, then boosted or, or whatever, but what are the variants that the population initially got infected with and the variant? So, so many things are different. So, just to finish off with the final bit of bad news, okay, before we get into the good news, okay, is that now there's a lot of talk where Omicron came from, okay, and what, what will happen with future variants. Now, the thing with uh, COVID, I mean, a lot of people were talking about let's eradicate COVID, but it was never possible like smallpox because smallpox only infects humans. The SARS CoV 2 is not like that. It infects, readily infects a lot of animals. Okay, so earlier we knew that it infected uh, things like tigers and lions, but infecting tigers and lions are fine because humans naturally go, don't go and interact with tigers and lions and these other wild animals. But then, of course, we found that the virus readily infects deer. Okay. So studies done in New York, so these are just deer hanging around everywhere. Uh, so the deer got uh, a lot of infection. The zero positivity of deer increased very much with alpha variant. I mean, if you remember a long time ago, last year this time we were thinking about the alpha variant. So the deer got infected with alpha variant. And of course, now they are, have a very high infection rate with Omicron. And Omicron naturally readily infects rodents like the mice we have in the rats we have in our garden. Okay, so now the problem is so when it goes into a different host, it adapts to that host and then it mutates and then it can get a reverse spillover. So the spillover is the first time a virus comes to us, like the SARS CoV 2, it came from whatever animal to us. That's the first spillover. The reverse spillover is we infect the animal again and then the animal infects us again. So then you get a much better or I don't know, whatever mutated virus. Some of these viruses may not be bad, may not be transmissible, but the ones that take off are the transmissible ones. So, uh, so we have to watch out. Okay, so that's the bad news. Now let's get to the good news. Okay, now coming to the good news, uh, boosters are effective. Although uh, Omicron and whatever variant might be the immunity neutralizing antibodies, that is not the only way that people are protected from infection. There are things called cellular immunity, T-cell immunity, and so on. So there's another big arm of the immune system apart from antibodies. So when you look at this data, uh, Switzerland and United States in different age group, the gray bars are the deaths per 100,000 in unvaccinated. The red bars are deaths per 100,000 in uh, fully vaccinated, that is with two doses. And then these green ones, which you can hardly see, are the deaths in boosted individuals. So in all age groups, the boosters do significantly reduce the uh, risk of death. And how much, if you look at overall death rates, uh, with two doses, it reduces the death by 14%, but with three doses, boosters, it reduces the death by 97 times. That's a huge reduction in death. So, okay, yes, it does evade the uh, immune responses. Yes, even after you take boosters, you can get infected like so many of you would have already maybe got infected. And we know that enough people who got boosters got infected, but they don't get severe disease and they don't die. So we can get new variants, but as long as we, we are protected, uh, we won't, I mean, if it's like a common cold, that is not too bad. And of course, all people sitting here, young people, uh, 
course, it's called us. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> anyway, uh, so of course, we are not going to dilate this part the most, but we are thinking of hospitalization. Nobody wants to go into hospital because of obvious reasons. And so with the Omicron wave, this is in US, the num uh, increase in hospitalizations in unvaccinated, fully vaccinated, and in those with boosters. So boosters significantly reduce the risk of you ending up in hospital. And of course, these boosters are safe. Sri Lanka has given out 6.8 million booster doses. But as we know, our boost uptake is very low. Uh, it's about 30.5% as, as of yesterday. Uh, and of course, if we really increase our boost uptake, then uh, whatever variant comes, or uh, because I don't know what the BA2 effect is in the other parts of Thailand, uh, we will be all right. And we can't have a, uh, given the bad situation we are in, uh, economically and otherwise, we cannot afford any, you know, things spreading and causing devastation because we are not in a position to uh, take it. Um, now coming, ending with the future of COVID. And so we cannot get rid of COVID for all the reasons I said. I mean, it's everywhere and of course, in energy, we have a huge animal reservoir. New variants will emerge. There's no question about that. And any new variant that emerges, gets rid of Omicron, has to be more transmissible than that. We don't know whether it's going to be mild or severe. Uh, it depends on how the virus mutates. The virus does not have any luck towards us to become mild as it goes on. So we cannot predict that. Uh, but of course, move boosters do make it milder. And we will probably have ups and downs and small, small waves, or hopefully not big waves of uh, COVID in future. But just because COVID is not over, okay, we need long-term measures. Masks are effective. Uh, and we probably don't need to continue it in use. Okay, so when we did a study, our one year AstraZeneca agreed in healthcare workers, very few doctors had got infected, surprisingly compared to the general public. So infection rate in doctors appear to be uh, much lower, and the infect infections that doctors got, I believe, are from families. Their children are somebody immune to them, and unlikely to be in hospital. So in indoor environments, masks seem to work, but uh, do seem to be very effective, which has been proven, not, not just a uh, hypothesis. But uh, do we need to wear it outdoors continuously when you're walking around on the road or something like that? That's some time to think about that. But ventilation is the key. So all the countries which are sort of declaring that COVID is over, now for instance, the UK, uh, COVID positive individuals do not need to isolate from the 1st of March. They don't need to test. So, and Europe is going to follow that line. Uh, so basically, it's just other uh, common cold like we had earlier. Uh, but they're very much focusing on ventilation. They are, when they're building their new buildings and even existing buildings, they're improving ventilation. They are, some of the shopping malls in various countries are fixing these carbon dioxide particle monitors, which gives an idea about ventilation. So they're doing all that. But in Sri Lanka, in our schools, hospitals, we have natural ventilation. I mean, this is a typical Sri Lankan school where there is absolutely good ventilation and you can't get better than that. Uh, so we need to stop unnecessary precautions. I think even still in some places, they do this mass disinfection and disinfecting surfaces, which actually has no use and it's environmentally not very expensive and actually causes harm. And the UNICEF, after the, doing such a lot of research, going through all the research articles, it has declared that school should be the last to close and the first to open. Our children have already lost so much in their education. So when things are going to be as it is forever, okay, I will come to the ever part, okay, then are we going to be like this forever? Okay, so that is an important question we need to understand. So we need to have long-term strategies. We can't, you know, think about next month or the other month, uh, like the way we think about electricity. We have to have long-term plans as far as health is concerned, which we can uh, do. So we need to detect new variants to understand what is going on. So we need to have a proper surveillance system, and the surveillance system should also include animals. Okay. So we can't just think about ourselves anymore. We have to take a one health approach. We have to understand what is going on in animals if you want to be safe. And 
we have to have data regarding persistence of immunity following natural infection, vaccination, and for variants. Uh, and of course, this is not the end. Uh, all everywhere, so many institutions are looking at a universal coronavirus vaccine. We call it the parents Avibo virus vaccine. Uh, and so that you cover any possible future variant and all the existing human coronaviruses, which include seasonal coronaviruses. Uh, now, they have been trying since the beginning of last year, so it's been a while. So although we developed this COVID vaccine very fast, that is a very sort of simple vaccine. When you are developing a plan, a coronavirus vaccine or a universal, universal vaccine, it's a little bit more troublesome and, and you need more expert. So, so I hope, let's hope that it becomes a reality and this could sort of end things for us. Uh, and with that, uh, I would like to end my talk. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nisa. We have some time for questions. Actually, for the participants who are joining virtually, you can type in your question in the chat box. Please do type it. Any questions from the audience? Yes, so there is data from Israel showing uh, because they did a trial with the fourth uh, booster dose which didn't show uh, increased efficacy. So this is why countries are not adapting the fourth dose except in the immunosuppressed. And UK is of course giving it in over 75 because like the very elderly, because even that it wasn't a very good effect. So uh, just to uh, increase immunity, UK is starting in over 75, but you know, I don't know if other countries will follow, uh, but basically a four dose doesn't increase immunity unless you're immunosuppressed. Sorry? Yeah, that is after six months, yes. Yeah. It, it has no benefit for people younger, people younger than 75 uh, with uh, an impact immune system. But if you have renal transplant, cancers, then a fourth dose may be beneficial because some people do have no response for the first two doses at all. Yeah, so the five to 12 year old children, they have, uh, I mean, US, Canada, and several countries have done it because of the Pfizer. Uh, and that is one third of the dose that is being used in adults. Uh, and according to their data, uh, so many countries have used it, not a single uh, episode of myocarditis has been reported. So, uh, so that one third dose appears to be quite effective in reducing severe disease. I mean, severe disease is very rare in children anyway, but. Uh, we don't know what will happen in the future. So, and then all for this uh, uh, other complications, inflammatory disease and everything, uh, long COVID, the vaccine does really significantly reduce all those complications. So, uh, like the way that, like, let, let's say you have a, a dog, okay? So dogs don't cause reverse uh, spillover by the way. So let's say you, you give COVID to a dog, so the virus mutates in the dog, and then when you associate the dog, <laughs> uh, because the dog, of course, then would have, uh, you know, the virus in the environment, like immediate environment, so yeah, then you... Only an the, 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 the dog, the dog will... Just the contact of droplets. Uh, the droplets, or, I mean, if, if it's a dog, fortunately, uh, dogs are not that more, not that infected, but otherwise it's droplet spread. So, uh, so this is why uh, if it goes to animals that uh, humans interact with, like deer. So apparently in New York, a lot of humans do actually inter because deer are harmless animals. And and in if you take somewhere like Trinco, deers are everywhere, and uh, they don't move away, and humans touch deer, and so you get quite close to deer. So if it's a tiger or a lion, that's fine because we have no interaction with them. But if it's the type of animals we do have interaction, then they're in trouble. And especially farm animals. Now, if you look at, if you remember the mink episode where Denmark got rid of about, I think, 15 million uh, minks. So what happened happened was the farm, the farmers in the farm gave COVID to the mink, and then you the mink, the virus mutated inside the mink, and you got a mink period, and they reinfected the uh, the farmers. So the, so that's why they were called because it was a mink virus. Now I'm not the the original thing. 
Yes, cats. Yeah, yeah. But, but they haven't shown to uh, reinfect humans uh, <laughs> so far. So uh, now there, there is uh, some data coming from South Africa and also from USA showing that although Omicron is mild, it seems to be causing certain complications in one to four year olds. Uh, but no, not older, but it's like this. Uh, now, unlike Delta, we, let's say Delta caused 20% of infections in children, Omicron is infecting like 60 to 70%. So then, because the denominator is much bigger, you will have more, uh, it's like one in 1,000 had a complication. Now, now it's not 1,000, it's like 100,000. Then you will see a, a number of new. So they, predict, they have found out in the UK, for instance, because UK have a, hasn't vaccinated 5 to 11 year olds. In the last three weeks, 50% of those children in UK have got infected with Omicron. So that's a large population of children just getting infected within three weeks, 50% uh, of the school going population. They get? I, I don't know. I mean, it's not reported, uh, and it's important to find out what sort of people are uh, reporting like measles. I think, I mean, uh, there are enough and more people sitting here who have got boosters. I don't know if anybody uh, observed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it's, it's whether they had the, like various things and uh, other issues going on is, is the question. No, I mean, not like that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, yes, yes. So I think it's, it's also saying that the booster causes this, this, and then it's psychologically. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, the vaccinated child uh, infected with COVID. Uh, so, so they can wait for like uh, one or two months uh, before getting the vaccine. Minimum of four weeks. Thank you very much. I would like to invite Professor Nilika Malaki to receive the certificate of appreciation. Right, okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so, thank you very much. Uh, uh, the uh, team of the Clinical Society of uh, London South Asian Hospital for inviting for this talk. So today uh, I thought uh, we'll speak about something uh, more general uh, and important for you all in the primary care practice. Uh, um, uh, and uh, I'm taking everyone away from the COVID as well. Right. So the, today's topic is about chronic cough in children. So what, what would be your approach uh, when you encounter a patient in the outpatient? So, uh, cough is kind of a common uh, respiratory symptom uh, 
that you see in your GP practice or in the outpatient department, but it is also transpecific because we, as respiratory physician, we have a couple of symptoms, uh, just cough, wheeze, chest tightness or difficulty in breathing. So we have to work it out what is underlying these symptoms. So it is really important uh, to may take an structured approach when you see the patients, uh, especially when they're coming with uh, cough sort of non-specific symptoms. So the eat, uh, I would take the cough uh, as a symptom rather than a diagnosis. And then the underlying cause could be vary from uh, simple upper respiratory tract infection to a complex bronchiectasis. So it is really important to identify the underlying cause uh, to manage them and to do prompt treatment to prevent further damage. So all these uh, timelines for cough is often arbitrary and it is all uh, made through the observational studies. But uh, what is most important is what is your clinical judgment towards patients' general health, especially the child's general uh, well-being and uh, whether we are looking, uh, seeing any specific cough pointers towards a specific diagnosis. So if you look at the timelines, so you may see uh, when a child comes with a cough, so it could be following a prolonged course, uh, following an acute cough. So there may be a little delay in delivery, a recovery. Uh, so even a simple upper respiratory tract infection, the cough may last for about three weeks. So, uh, and then if you see the this line, so that is a sort of a persistent non remitting symptom. So there's no sort of uh, uh, symptom free intervals. And then again, you can have multiple uh, recurrent uh, acute coughs with, uh, uh, without any interval symptoms. So unfortunately, not like COVID, we don't have much of systematically found data about prevalence among the children, but however, uh, approximately one third of the preschool children is reporting cough in a given time. So compared to the adults, the underlying diagnosis is often different in the children. And uh, so it is more often become a prolonged infection or congenital reasons. So, uh, and the other thing, if you think of a cough in a child, we are not just dealing with the child. So it's child is a part of the family. So the parents are distressed, the family is distressed, is each time child cough, so you're in distress. So they need, they are seeking a lot of medical uh, advice and uh, medical care. So there is a burden to the system and uh, it is uh, also compromise their quality of life. So it is important to approach uh, structurally uh, into a simple uh, symptom, right? So what is cough? So we are going back to the med school. So we were told that it's a protective airway reflex. So you're forcefully exhaling against your glottis, uh, closed glottis, and that is associated with a characteristic sound. And then the two main functions is to clear the secretions from the large airways, as well as to prevent small uh, or the foreign bodies entering your lower airways. So if you think of a scenario, so because I'm a clinician, so I'll be going towards the clinical side. So if you see a child in the outpatient department and mother brings an, a child and say, doctor, this child is coughing for a longer time. So what, what comes into your mind? So what would be your differential diagnosis if you see a child? So it could be related to the pulmonary causes, the lung related causes, or even unrelated to the lungs, but uh, it can manifest with cough. So there are a list of things. And in our part of the world, when a child coming with a chronic cough, not even a child or an adult, anyone, so the T becomes uh, as the first cause. So mostly the chronic infections and uh, the chronic superiority lung disease, we call bronchiectasis. And then most often we label them as having asthma, and then uh, maybe they're having recurrent uh, aspirations or airway abnormalities. And then if you think of extra pulmonary causes, so they, uh, the, even the cardiac uh, diseases can come with cough. Uh, they might be having, right. 
So uh, we were talking about the comatosis, what comes into your mind uh, when a child comes with a chronic cough. So it could be pulmonary causes or maybe related to the extra pulmonary causes. And then, uh, so what is the first question that comes into your mind if you see, if you see a child with a cough? So you, you may ask how, how long has been the child coughing for? So that is really important uh, to think of the etiology and approaching the patient. So all these, as I said earlier, all these uh, timelines are arbitrary. Everything's come from observational studies. So we often like to follow some of the guidelines uh, from the West. So this is one of the uh, uh, interesting and important uh, guidelines coming from the chest. Uh, which is from UK, as well as we are using uh, European Respiratory Society guidelines as well for all this uh, uh, clinical approach. So here, of course, they have been using the chronic cough uh, is uh, the cough lasting more than four weeks. So generally, we, in our context, we are alert by the two weeks of a child having a cough because we know in the TB guidelines, we take two weeks as the cutoff. And uh, so in that, but we have to keep that in mind because even in an acute infection, that cough can last for a longer, but we have to uh, keep that in mind and uh, work out uh, when the two weeks is over. So if you look at the most common causes in uh, all this data from West, not from our country, so uh, the common causes are for the prolonged acute cough in children are the post-viral or post-infectious. So it can last for about from three to eight weeks. So uh, that is important as well as if you look at uh, the most common chronic cough in children, so the protracted bacterial bronchitis come into the uh, top of the list. So if you look at this uh, couple of uh, data uh, from the other countries, uh, all these uh, age groups, uh, in the, the first and the last row, the, uh, the mean, mean age group was 2.6 here and the 4.5 uh, here. And then, so that means in the very younger children, so you would expect to have ongoing bacterial infection, which can lead to chronic cough among the children that is coming to the top. And if you look at the older children, so the mean age is 8.4, that is school going children, so the, still the uh, PB, PBB is there, but at the same time, you have asthma and upper airway cough syndrome in the uh, scenario. So we have to keep these uh, facts in our mind when we approach a child. So the most importantly, uh, what is important in the primary care practice is not to miss sinister pathologies. So we have to concentrate on the cough pointers or the red flag signs. So it is really important that we uh, approach child with a detailed history as well as good physical examination. I know it's, it's not very uh, it's a bit difficult in the primary care. So we have a very good, uh, big uh, patient load. But if we think of a couple of these cough pointers, then that will easily screen the children that who are possibly having underlying sinister pathology. So if you hear a child who's having a daily wet cough, and then if the cough is affecting their daily life, like uh, their play, playfulness and their exercise is uh, impaired and their uh, sleep is uh, affected by having the nocturnal cough and their growth is affected, then you have to be cautious. And then at the same time, you can look at the child and see whether there's any evidence of chronic hypoxia like clubbing, or any cyanosis, so, and uh, if there's any uh, chest deformities, in that case, you have to be very cautious. At the same time, we as pediatrician, we just don't look at the system. Like, so if that child is coming with cough, you are not just looking at the respiratory system. So you have to look at the child holistically. So it's like a full child. So look at the child's face, see whether the child looks normal, is there any dysmorphic features, whether the child is de looks developmentally normal, whether the child has immunization. So those factors are also important if you're thinking of uh, when you're approaching a child. At the same time, 
uh, just ask from the mother whether this is the first episode where the child is getting sort of repeated infection like this. So that gives you a clue whether the child is having something underlying in the lung or whether the child is having something related to their immune, immune status. So it is really important to look at these cough pointers even during your BC uh, clinics. So it is quite easier if you think uh, of the phenotype of the cough or like what cough look like whether it's like sort of a wet cough or a dry cough. So that gives you kind of approach that where I'm heading to. So if you think of a wet cough, that shows that the airways are full of secretions. So there may be ongoing infection or inflammation. And if it is dry, it's often following irritation of your airways. So we have to think of um, commonly the post-viral cough. And then uh, the pertussis is not very common among us because our vaccination program is very good. Uh, but however, uh, with the mycoplasma and other viral infection can cause pertussis like uh, a pit picture. And then again, the asthma and then uh, allergic rhinitis and upper airway cough syndrome, gastroesophageal reflux that we need to consider. So we look uh, about the, some of these uh, diseases. So I thought the uh, giving a little more information about the PVB is important. So initially this was described as an adult disease, but now it is well recognized among the children as well. So how you diagnose that is the child is having a wet cough, a prolonged cough, which is responding to a prolonged cause of antibiotic. And you don't have any other features to suggest uh, any other underlying pathology. So that is the criteria to say PVP. So the child may be initially starting with the upper respiratory or initial respiratory symptoms and then having ongoing cough for a longer duration. But just giving antibiotics for a couple of days would not sort. So here, of course, at least we have to try with two to four weeks of antibiotics. And then if you look at the microbiology of this uh, airway samples, it is often caused by hemophilus influenza, Maraxilla, or strep pneumonia. So the recommended drug of choice is coamoxiclib. So, uh, and always we recommend go for an airway sampling. So I know it's very difficult to find, get a sputum sample from a child. It's very difficult. But of course, if you get our help from the pediatric side, so we can uh, help with the induced sputum and other sampling. So it is really important to have sputums or the microbiology uh, behind the infection and then treat accordingly. And then you have to be very cautious if the child is not responding to your antibiotic course and if the symptoms are recurring, then you need specialized investigation further. So this is sort of we have to consider. And then the next important uh, disease that uh, we consider in our context is the tuberculosis. So in adults, we say if the cough is more than two weeks and they are having some non-specific generalized symptoms, so it is TB unless proven otherwise. But if you look at the children's uh, uh, timeline, so you see uh, with the, they will, uh, the time goes up and the child grows, so there's no disease even following uh, the exposure in 80 to 90 percent of the children if it is if they are more than 10 years but and however they develop only 10 to 20 percent of them can develop pulmonary disease so in very younger children it's not the primary pulmonary tuberculosis we see it's mainly the lymphadenopathy or the bronchitis or just uh, the gonfogus mainly the lymphadenopathy is the uh, presenting C, uh, feature in the younger children. So that we have to keep in mind. So often they would not come with a wet cough. So they might come with a wheeze or a dry cough because the adenopathy, the uh, paratracheal lymph nodes and the high adenopathy that will cause obstruction in their small airways, major airways. So that is, you have to keep in mind. So always the children who are coming with, wet, uh, uh, who are diagnosed to have TB, pulmonary TB, it's not mainly the wet cough, you see. And then, so this is quite important fact. Now, uh, if you look at the, this is from WHO, and then if you look at the epidemiology of the pulmonary TB, the TB among the children, so you might see if it is more common in children uh, who are less than five years. And now the, uh, globally, they are, we are facing uh, another challenge that is we have HIV TB dual infection. 
So we have to be careful. And once if you diagnose a child with tuberculosis, now it is mandatory from the WHO for our developing countries that we have to look for the retrovirus uh, status. So it is really important to identify the dual infection. One thing, the outcome is going to be different. And the second thing, your treatment plan is going to be different because uh, if you start retroviral uh, treatment and then you will get uh, immune uh, reconstitution syndromes later. When, uh, so there will be sort of uh, difference in the management. So it is really important to identify the retroviral uh, status of these children. And then this is the simple diagram. We, uh, I took it from a uh, small, uh, from the internet. So this is the picture that we always remember with all these fever, cough to more than two weeks and having weight loss, lethargy, and with the contact history, we say it's TB. But remember, so most importantly, the majority of children that we see with the pulmonary TB, they are coming with poorly resolving pneumonia or complicated pneumonias and maybe with underlying uh, immune deficiency. And we have to be very careful because we are getting a lot of immigrants and displays population uh, to our primary care. So it is important to keep in mind that uh, the tuberculosis is there and we need to screen them for that. And then, uh, so how do we investigate? So what are the sample that we can get? That is uh, mainly the gastric lavage, you know, that we take early morning gastric lavage sample for AFBs and then for the culture. And then it is mandatory from the WHO now to use the gene expert uh, as the first line investigation to diagnose TB in children. And then, of course, we can take induced sputum, so that could be done. And then uh, uh, the important importance of using the gene expert is it simultaneously check your rifampicin resistance. Uh, of the mycobacteria. So that will guide your treatment plan because uh, it uh, diagnoses your uh, drug resistant state. So shall we move to a case? So this is a three-year-old girl. So she was presented to us with uh, poorly responding cough for about three months. And then it has been a wet cough throughout the day, no diurnal variation, and even in the night child coughing, and then uh, there's no sort of general symptoms like uh, no weight loss, no changes in the appetite. So the child has been taken to multiple doctors and given multiple doses of antibiotic. And at the time we see her, uh, so child had uh, was in a combined inhale as well. So but mother didn't found any sort of response to any of these features. So what do you think? Any thoughts? Okay, right. Okay, I'll proceed because of the time. So we took a detailed history and then uh, and then did examination, found some changes in the uh, entry and uh, monophonic Vs. Uh, uh, mother clearly says that uh, a child had anyway had a cough uh, with upper respiratory tract infection and when child was having a cough, uh, sweet calm, then had sort of aspiration at that point. And if you look at this x-ray, so you may see uh, the hyperinflation of the left side. And uh, so this is the CT uh, blocking a piece of sweet corn in the left main bronchus. So it is a partial obstruction and uh, causing air trapping in the left side. So we have to remember that uh, uh, a late onset cough uh, without a pattern, which is fitting into the general picture. So then you have to be cautious. So the child was started on inhaler because we have we have we have mindset that chronic cough in children cough variant asthma, right? Okay. So we are moving to the asthma. So yes, it is uh, the chronic cough is a symptom of asthma that we agree. But there is a uh, clinical uh, pattern of the disease presentation. So often it's not it's very unlikely that they are having a, one symptom. Often it's a combination of uh, multiple respiratory symptoms. So they have varying in degree with cough or wheeze or like chest tightness. And then essentially they demonstrate the bronchodilator reversibility. That means when you give a short acting beta agonist, a salbutamol like drug, so they will get a relief. So currently we are following uh, the GINA guideline. Uh, so they 
give us some guidance how uh, what are the key features to diagnose asthma so this is easily downloadable into your smartphone there is a pocket guideline so you can follow that i know it's not really easy to demonstrate the variable uh, airway obstruction with the spirometry but we have all good uh, peak flow meters so you can use it and demonstrate the variability and of course the gina gives us uh, the uh, opportunity to use a trial of uh, inhale corticosteroid and to see the response in 3 months time but essentially you have to see the response to the inhale corticosteroid if there's no response please do not continue that or do not step up that please refer to the child to a specialist that they can do further evaluation because we do have the spirometries even in hospital and then we have uh, you might have he heard about the fractional exhale nitric oxide the pheno so where you can find out look for the uh, eosinophilic airway inflammation so we do have the facility to do a proper diagnosis if the child is more than 6 years please do the test and then only start the uh, treatment and then these are the guides given by the gina guideline for the when the child is less than 5 years and more than 6 years that is of course you can refer and uh, remember now <coughs> excuse me uh, we do not uh, we are not using salbutamol as the required basis uh, in children who are diagnosed to have uh, sorry so we are not using salbutamol alone as a treatment for the treatment of asthma in children so it is always now the step one is you start inhale corticosteroid so earlier we used to give by looking at their frequency of symptoms we used to give uh, only the salbutamol so it is quite different when you think of a baby children a child less than 5 years where you are not uh, very uh, precise whether the child is having real asthma or it is viral induced pain so in that case we are after 5 years we are not recommending to use salbutamol alone so you have to start on inhale corticosteroid so there are data that you can use as uh, intermittent and uh, long course as well so that depends on the uh, child symptom frequency so you can refer this guideline so this is very useful in the outpatient department so there are uh, there's another uh, case presentation again uh, a 10 month old baby so coming with cough for uh, since 2 weeks of age so the initial uh, episode mom remember it has 2 weeks and she was managed as bronchiolitis and then discharge and then but mom says like child had to have this uh, wet sort of a cough she can't exactly say what the nature of the cough but having repeated hospital admission the child is getting bouts of cough and then given multiple antibiotics and at the time we saw the child was on viewed as an i form of drug inhaler so it's very strong uh uh steroids and at the same time the form of drug that we are not recommending in children younger children and then uh, so again child was never developmentally normal and then uh, we have done the x ray and you can see there's a right couple of pigsiness so it was suggestive of uh, aspiration in the younger children in infants where because they lie and the most dependent part is the right upper lobe and then uh, we did a swallowing assessment so if there was a pharyngeal phase dysphagia so child was not safe uh, in the liquids so which was uh, confirmed by the video fluoroscopy so what is uh, important here is we always think of aspiration in developmentally abnormal child especially cerebral palsy and other neurodevelopmental disorders but we never think that the children who are developmentally normal could have aspiration no it is not we even we talk on ourselves isn't it so uh, there may be maturational delay in children uh, for their swallowing so it is well recognized and then please keep in mind that to ask mother specifically if they say that child is coughing specify whether it's with water with solids and then you can get sort of a grading of an idea about what they are talking about then this is sort of uh, uh, a very uh, sort of uh, not uh, there's no sort of consensus about these facts so do uh, in a child who is coming with cough 
but you don't see any sort of uh, cough pointers and uh, no specific uh, other system involvements. And then, the, but mother says the child is coughing, but you need to give something. So do you tend to give any medicines for them? So I've seen that we are giving domperidone, famotidine, omeprazole, or the uh, cetirizine or like loratidine. So empirically, we think are uh, maybe because a child may be having a bit of a reflux and then, uh, so it might work. But of course, no empirical treatment with uh, for GORD or to upper airway cough syndrome. So we have to look for the signs and symptoms which is suggestive of GOR. If the mother says the child is having regurgitation features and then having heartburns, and then if it is symptoms are suggestive because we don't have much facility here to do the uh, period studies and impedance studies for children for each and every child. So if there's no symptoms, please do not give medicines if it is not indicated. And then the other thing, if you are treating for a GOR, it's not just a short course of one week or two weeks or like just for a couple of days. So it has to be under proper guidance. So ideally it is to be four to eight weeks. So you need to follow these guidelines. So that's why the guidelines are formed. And then even for the allergic rhinitis, so if the child is having nasal symptoms, congestion, rhinorrhea, and then, uh, uh, then we would think of uh, the, uh, allergic rhinitis. And then now, of course, uh, there is some guidance uh, from the area, uh, which is for allergic rhinitis and its impact for asthma collaborations. So we tend to uh, categorize children into uh, based on their frequency of symptoms and how it affects their quality of life. So if you see here in a mild intermittent where the child is having symptoms only for a couple of days per week, less than four days per week, and then it's not affecting their life, then you don't have to give intranasal corticosteroid every day. So you can manage with the uh, PRN uh, antihistamine. So likewise, uh, we need to give specific treatment only and not to too medicalize the parents and the children. And then this is again, uh, this is not a very new entity, but we need to consider. So uh, breathing pattern disorder. So that means that child is not learned to breathe properly. So there are differences in their breathing patterns. So that can lead to dry cough and other respiratory symptoms uh, as a chronic basis. So there are a couple of uh, breathing pattern ways. So child may be hyperventilating. So child is trying to get oxygen on with through increasing their uh, heart rate or uh, respiratory rate, or maybe time to time they are taking a deep breath, deep signing, and then uh, they are just using their APCs and like here. And then they come and say like they have body aches, neck pains and the back pains. So it is really important to look at the way how the child is breathing. And then sometimes if you look at, even if you keep your hand into your tummy and say like how you breathe, when you inspirate whether the, your abdomen is uh, moving forward. And uh, sometimes it is not. So we are also breathing paradoxically most of it. So it is really important in children to identify those things. And then, uh, this is another uh, uh, issue that uh, often we manage with inhalers. So often we misdiagnose the mass asthma as well. So uh, this is another child who's coming with eight, eight year old child. It's sort of all the children uh, coming with persistent cough and she had a lot of course of pregnancy loan because child is getting uh, uh, episodes of uh, wheezing as well. We, not wheezing, difficult in breathing as well. So is it this really asthma? But uh, if you look at this, this was a cardiopulmonary exercise test that we did for the child. And then if you look at the uh, peak oxygen consumption, their aerobic capacity, it's quite supernormal. But if you look at their breathing pattern, so this red line shows the uh, respiratory rate. And then this blue line shows the uh, tidal volume. So ideally in the exercise, you would see initial rise in your tidal volumes and then later you increase your heart respiratory rate to maintain your oxygenation. So what is happening here is child just increasing the respiratory rate and then not improving the tidal volumes at all. And then here again, you can see the tidal volumes are flat with erratic breathing patterns. So it is really important to get a 
have an idea about these conditions as well. And then, so what do you think about chronic nocturnal cough? So it is, as a symptom, is most, mostly unreliable. So, but, and the other thing, it is not always the asthma. So we need to consider reflux because uh, when they lie down and after a full meal, and then uh, again, uh, we forgotten this area, the sleep disordered breathing in children. So they might have been snoring or having apnea and then all of a sudden he cough and wake up. So it is really important to identify the pattern of the symptoms. Right, so this is uh, the last bit and then uh, about the habit cough. So we tend to call it the psychogenic cough. So the most uh, remarkable factor here, uh, the features that you can elicit in your practice is uh, see whether it is inconsistent with other any other chronic tick disorders. At the same time, if you ask them to uh, reproduce the cough, they can, they can imitate and say, they can show you how, your, how they are coughing. And the other thing, it is often absent during the sleep. So it is really important to think about psychological factors of the children as well. So we have our psychiatrist here, so we can get the help of them. So it is important to look after their minds as well, other than the lungs. So uh, it is mainly uh, the getting uh, the help from the psychiatrist. So and lastly, I would like to say a couple of things that uh, we would like if you uh, can refer these children to a specialist, a pediatrician or a, a chest specialist when they are coming, when the cough start in the neonatal or the early infancy period. So at least unless proven otherwise, there is something wrong with their airways or their swallow. And then if there's daily wet cough, so that is a simple indicator of uh, uh, chronic superiority lung disease, we say bronchiectasis. And then so you have been trying to manage with simple measures, but it's me not improving. So wait for about four weeks. You can watch full wait for about four weeks. And if it is not responding, please do refer them. And then get a good history about, especially in the toddlers, there can be inhaled foreign bodies. And then uh, if there's any evidence of chronic lung disease and recurrent infections or recurrent pneumonias. And then uh, despite everything, parent is not happy. So that comes, uh, we, we often not uh, tend to uh, take that part, but uh, in the other countries, so this comes in the top. But uh, here we have to remember because parents are the people who live with the child all the time. So if they have a concern, please do listen to them. So there must be something wrong. <clears throat> right. So just to uh, finish uh, my presentation, so these are the guidelines laid by the uh, ERS and, and the chest, but far more or less the same, same. So you take a detailed history examination and you do investigation when it is indicated. And then uh, if you uh, see whether it's wet or a dry cough, so wet cough, you better go for a, a sputum analysis, identify the organism and treat accordingly. And if it is dry cough, think about mostly commonly the post-infection diseases as well as the other condition we discussed. And then, um, so here, of course, uh, this is for the wet cough, the algorithm. And so this is a sort of controversial area. Uh, often the specialist doesn't like to reveal it, this part. So in the guideline, of course, they give you an opportunity to start on an inhale trial of inhaled corticosteroids after evaluating the child, if you can't find any cough pointers and you can give a trial, and but it's only for two to four weeks. And after four weeks, you have to uh, reassess the patient and stop it because often there is a period effect. And then uh, even without the inhaler, child might have responded the uh, result with the cough. So here, of course, uh, whether it's resolved or not resolved, then stop it and then follow up in other two weeks. If the symptoms recurring, you can restart it. But if not, please do not continue the inhaler. And then, yes. So the take home messages are th think structurally when a child comes with a non-specific symptom and then do investigation whenever necessary. And then your prompt evaluation and referral will save the lives of children. Thank you. Is there anyone to
Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Madam and the Indian Society, for inviting me to on this important topic. So, uh, I think during the pandemic, children and adolescents have received much less attention because uh, they are less likely to get infected. And as uh, Professor Nilika mentioned, the, they are less likely to also develop physical complications. So, because of that, they have been received relatively less attention, but the psychosocial impact due to the uh, restrictions, social restrictions, and lifestyle changes have been marked, and still we have not uh, properly acknowledged. So that's why I thought uh, it's important to talk about this topic. Right. So why does the pandemic affect the mental well-being of children and adolescents? So the main reason is the prolonged school closure. So we know in Sri Lanka, schools closed for the first time in um, March 2020, and it's been almost two years, but still the schools are not functioning properly. So school does not only provide education, it provides routine and structure to children. So since clo schools closed, children have nothing to do, and they will have lost all their routine, and they have lost their peer relationships. The children are still socially developing, and one way they, the main way they develop social interactions is through interactions with peers. So at any age, this uh, lack of interaction with peers that hinders their social and emotional development. And again, they have lost access to their extracurricular activities. So children relieve their stress through play. So when they uh, lose the opportunity to engage in extracurricular activities, that uh, takes away they are really important with stress. So that also makes them more vulnerable to develop psychological consequences. And again, they have to prefer to online learning without any prior preparation. So that can also be stressful. And there are a group of children who come from very maladaptive home environments. So for those group of children, their home, their school is the only place that they feel safe. So these children, since school, school closure, are now stuck at home in, with their dysfunctional families that again has contributed to increased risk of mental health problems. And again, there are some children who receive psychological support through school. So some children receive help through teachers and some through school counselors. So children has lost all support from teachers and counselors that also precipitate mental health problems in children. And not only that, the online learning itself can lead to mental health problems because all the children do not have the same resources and facilities to engage in online learning. So when they don't have the facilities, they may be stressed that they are falling behind their peers and that can act and be a burden to them. And again, online learning can especially be difficult for young children because young children, especially preschool and primary school children, they learn best through social interactions and activity-based learning. So you can't provide that through online learning. So they may find it very difficult to engage in uh, these studies as well as children with special needs. Again, children with special needs need one-to-one -one attention and extra support and an individual education plan, which cannot be provided through online learning. And then all the children and their families, a lot of them have been hit by these financial difficulties. Parents have uh, lost their jobs. And uh, sometimes they may have had difficulties in obtaining essential items, especially due to lockdown, so which can be an added stress. And the rates of uh, parental disharmony and also domestic violence has increased during the pandemic, due to, partly due to these uh, financial difficulties, and also increased parental stress. So increased parental stress is directly related to negative outcomes in the child. I just uh, later discuss briefly on that. And again, they have also lost 
access to psychological services like uh, community counseling services uh, that are provided to the AG office and the uh, National Child Protection Authority. All of these services were disrupted for some point. So all of these factors contribute to poor mental well-being on children. And children are actually more vulnerable to develop mental health problems uh, than adults in time of a pandemic because coping with stress is a developmentally acquired skill. And because children are still developing, they do not have the capacity to cope with stress as well as adults do. So because of that, they are less able to cope with the lifestyle changes that needed to be put in place at the time of COVID. So that, that, that's another reason why they are more likely to develop mental health problems than adults. And so what has, the, what has been the impact on education? So research done worldwide have found that children have poor motivation to engage in studies and poor attention to studies since the lockdown, especially to online learning. And this is more prominent in younger children. As I mentioned, they find it very difficult to engage in tasks when there's no individual attention. And children from low socioeconomic backgrounds are especially affected because they lack the resources and the UNICEF and the WHO estimate that there will be a huge school dropout at the end of this pandemic. So although there are no research examining the school dropout rate in children in Sri Lanka, we clinically find that a lot of children who are presented to our clinic, especially those uh, who had borderline school performance and you know being uh, pushed by teachers and uh, those uh, late adolescents, they are now dropping out of school. And that the gap between learning has increased. So, uh, some students made it through academically because of the extra support they received through teachers. And now because they don't receive such support, the gap in learning between students has been increased. And again, the educational outcomes of children with special needs, it has uh, worsened a lot. And there's another aspect. So, about children who have contracted COVID-19. So, there are some studies suggesting that there may be uh, possible executive weakness, attention deficits, and neurocognitive deficits associated with COVID-19. So if that's the case, these children are at a risk of developing academic difficulties, and they may need extra attention once school starts. And one of the other main problems that we come across is the excessive use of screens. So uh, there are no formal studies examining the uh, sort of problem in Sri Lanka during the pandemic. But several other countries, like in Turkey, they have found that parents reported 71 of the percent of the parents reported that there has been an increase in the screen time. And in South Korea, more than 80 percent have confirmed that. And in Italy, about four to five hour increase of screen time in children has been reported. So although there are no formal studies, when we take children presenting to our clinic. We find that the number presenting due to problems due to school, due to screen use, have markedly increased. So the highest increase in screen time is was seen in older children and in boys, and those who had low household income, and in those uh, where the father engaged in routine employment during the lockdown, most probably because uh, there must have been lack of supervision. And uh, in families where there are not rules relating to screen time and where the parents uh, are not consistent. So, this increased screen time is associated with a lot of physical as well as psychological problems. So, during the pandemic, they have found that this increased uh, the sedentary lifestyle associated with this increased screen time was associated with obesity, uh, high blood pressure, and other metabolic complications. And they have also described musculoskeletal effects like reduced bone density and musculoskeletal pain. And they have found that the visual problems like eye fatigue, myopia, dryness of eyes, blurring of vision have all increased during the pandemic and they attribute this to the increase in screen time. So, about the mental health consequences of increased screen time, so it's associated with attention deficit hyperactive disorder, depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, and uh, is exposed to violent content, like uh, lots of children play these uh, violent video games. So such violent content may actually increase aggression in children and uh, reduce their pro-social behaviors and increase their antisocial behaviors, and it makes them develop a lack of empathy. 
So I think it's important that we all know what are the indicators of screen addiction. So uh, the first one is the increasing time spent on screen. So the child may have initially started with one hour, but then gradually increased, and now he has no control of the time. So he's always on the screen. And then lying about the time spent on screen. So lying to us. So if we uh, take a history from a child who's coming with screen problems, if we ask the child, the child will usually minimize it. You know, I just stay on the screen for one hour. But if we ask the parent, it's a story, totally different story, right? And the same is children will lie to their parents as well. So some wait till their parents go to bed and stay up in the night to use the nighttime data. So lying about the time they spend on screen is also feature. And they find it difficult to control the amount of time they spend on screens. So some children actually want to reduce the time, but they are unable to do so. And when parents try to set limits around screen time, they become aggressive or irritable. So they may try to meet the parents, or they may try to, uh, to self harm, and they will they will have given up activities that they previously enjoyed to spend more time on screens. So let's say it's a child who likes reading or like singing or making things previously. Now he has given up all these activities and spending all that time on screens. And again, limiting our social interactions in order to be on the screen. So the parents will say now the child is hardly coming out of the room, is confined to his room, not talking with family members, just on the screen. So if we detect any of these features in a child, it's important to uh, refer to a mental health uh, clinic because it's very difficult to uh, sort of treat screen addiction once or, once it's gone on for a long time. And sleep disturbances have also been uh, commonly reported during the pandemic. So children have been going to bed later and waking up later. Again, this is due to school closure. They have there's no reason for them to get up in the morning because they have nothing to do. And their uh, quality of sleep has also decreased. And even those who go to sleep at time, they have delay in falling asleep. And they also have awakening throughout the night. And there are also refugees to sleep on their bed and anxiety at the time. So all these, uh, they say, may be a manifestation of anxiety due to the changes associated with uh, their lifestyle. And then, then again, there are emotional and behavioral problems. So about more than a quarter of children report worries related to uh, COVID-19. It may be about getting infected themselves or about uh, their parents getting infected and not believing they are uh, take care of them when the parent is ill. And a lot of them experience fatigue, loneliness, negative thoughts, lack of lack of enjoyment, and the prevalence of psychiatric disorders in children has increased by two to three fold during the pandemic. And the prevalence of anxiety and depression among children during the, being adolescent, adolescents during the pandemic is, was found to be as high as 40%. And the, attend, the number of attempts of suicide has also increased. So if you uh, recall recently in Sri Lanka, we had a lot of figure uh, for suicides of children, one as young, young as 12 years. Right? So the rates of suicides have markedly gone up. So emotional problems and behavioral difficulties were more found to be more common in girls than in boys. And those who lived in a community where there were higher number of COVID-19 and where the, there was increased parental stress and those coming from single parent families and low socioeconomic status and where the mother had a mental illness. And if the child had screen, from, screen problems, had didn't get enough exercise or spent too much time on screens. So what has been the impact of this on children with neurodevelopmental disorders or pre-existing psychiatric disorders? So adverse outcomes are much higher in children with neurodevelopmental disorders, those with special education need, chronic illness and pre-existing mental health problems. So in children with autism spectrum disorder, there were the frequency of disruptive behavior was shown to be increased and their mental health difficulties have increased and they were more likely to suffer. This, may, this was uh, found to lead to depression and anxiety in their parents as well. And in adolescents with ADHD, all the three symptoms, inattention, hyperactivity and impulsivity were shown to be increased and 
they also became more oppositional and defiant during this period, and all aspects of behaviors were noted to become worse. So there are several uh, reasons for this worsening of symptoms, apart from the ones that I already discussed. So one other reason was lack of access to medication. So the uh, you know even in Sri Lanka the clinics were closed and they had no way of coming to the clinic. And uh, difficulty uh, obtaining prescription and medication is one of the main reasons for worsening of mental health in these children. And then another aspect is the rising child abuse. So in Sri Lanka, from the 16th of March to the 7th of April, the first three weeks of the lockdown itself, 121 complaints of cruelty to children were received by the NCPA. So at the time, NCP and the UNICEF both expressed grave uh, concerns about this rising cruelty to uh, children. So what are the reasons for this increase in child abuse? Then one thing is the increased parental stress. So parents who are stressed are likely to be less tolerant. So they are likely to uh, punish their children more and punish their children more harshly. And now the whole family was spending time under one roof, whereas in the early the child spent at least six to seven hours per day at school. Now the whole family spending time together was also a risk factor for abuse in dysfunctional families. And again, the child had no nowhere to get help now. So usually when a child suffers physical abuse or some form of physical abuse, even if the child, if the child abuse is being taken place by the parents, it's the relatives or the teachers who notice the abuse and sometimes who report the abuse. Now, because of the lockdown, these children had no access to relatives and they did not meet the teachers. So they had no way of coming out of this situation. And again, there was disruption of the community welfare services and the child protective services. So the action taken against this abuse was also less. So I thought I'd uh, just discuss a few case scenarios that we came across. So we had this 17-year-old uh, boy who was from a leading boys school in Colombo. He was uh, doing well academically prior to the lockdown. He obtained uh, 10 years for the A-levels, O-levels, and he was uh, year 12. And the mother had gotten him a mobile phone to attend to the online classes. And um, after the lockdown, after the initial lockdown, both parents used to go to work, and this child and his, his sister were the only ones at home. And so this child started playing video games, uh, the two most popular ones, PUBG and uh, this uh, Call of Duty and something else. And they started playing this, he started playing this game and he started spending more and more time on this game. And parents actually uh, got to know this day because parents weren't at home and he used to stay up at night to use the nighttime data. And when the parents realized that he was addicted to screens and tried to repeat it, he became very aggressive. So he uh, threatened to, uh, he actually hit the parents and threatened to stab the parents and uh, threatened to kill his sister in the night. So he's a 17 year old boy, quite big. It was very difficult for the parents to control him. The parents were actually staying up at night, worrying that he might attack him. And he neglected himself. So this boy actually uh, didn't uh, sort of refrain from the game long enough to go to the toilet to pass urine. He kept a bottle near him and passed urine into this bottle while he was playing games. And he didn't wash in her bath for days. And he once did well at school and his school performance deteriorated markedly. So we had to get him down, uh, actually with the help of community workers. We had to admit him and keep him in the ward, just initially just to take the phone off him. Because it couldn't be done by the parents. And then we had to sort of train him to engage in normal activities. Uh, in a normal room, thing. so it took a long time for just to get him uh, into a normal sleep pattern and normal activities, day-to-day -day activities and social interactions. And uh, then there was this boy who was 15 years old. He was an only child, uh, and he was not very good at studies. He was uh, below average, but he was very good at sports. So he was in the uh, school sports. Uh, swimming and basketball team. So he had this strict routine every morning at 5 30 he had swimming and uh, three days a week afternoon he had basketball. So after the lockdown he had nothing. So he was not good at studies. So he was not that much interested in online learning. 
and his parents after the initial lockdown they had to go to work so this child had to be at home the one who had such an active lifestyle with nothing to do no one to talk to so eventually he became depressed and he presented to, presented to us after attempt on serious hanging so at that time he was found to be severely depressed and he needed to be started on medication and uh, this was a 14 year old girl who was the eldest of three children so the father was the breadwinner and he was uh, he had his own business so what he used to do was uh, sell t-shirts for uh, special events so uh, during the lockdown all the special events were cancelled and then he had no income and uh, the girl the father became depressed and suicidal and uh, the father openly talked about his suicidal thoughts in front of the girl which uh, the, it was a great stress for the child the father also received treatment he also was admitted to the ward and later the child had the child was going to international school but during the lockdown also they needed to pay uh, for the online teaching so then they had to be taken off the uh, international school with the hope of putting to a government school later and there was marked change in her living circumstances so with all these she had a depressive episode we needed and presented to us and we had to start her on medication and this was again a common scenario we have seen during the past few months so this is a 15 year old girl this girl was also high achieving child and both parents were actually professionals uh, so again the mother had bought this child a uh, mobile phone to access online learning and then where she, she has created this facebook account and had a relationship with a much older man around 26 or 27 and uh, parents had to parents had to go to because they couldn't take extended leave and this child was at home alone and the mother used to ask the neighbor to keep an eye on her so during this period uh, so she has invited her boyfriend to come to the house just to have a chat after the boyfriend has asked and she said okay and then this girl was raped by uh, this boyfriend and presented to us the symptoms of depression and PTSD so this actually has been quite common girl starting affairs uh, through Facebook and WhatsApp and coming with sexual abuse. Right, so what can we do for this? So as uh, Prof. Nidika mentioned, this pandemic is going to go on for a long time and there may be uh, future lockdowns and future restrictions. So what can we do? So what can the parents do? What can we ask the parents to do? So it's important that the parents promote routines at home, even though they are not school, have a uh, set big time and a waking time uh, and encourage physical activity at least half an hour play outside uh, run around play you know just uh, play do something with the child and promote them to do some hobbies the things that they usually do maybe uh, sing songs draw or they ask them to take up a new hobby and another important thing is have realistic expectations of online learning so we get a uh, get children with, and parents with lots of problems related to online learning. So parents expect the children to do the same with online learning, same enthusiasm, same motivation to online learning as to in-person learning, which is which is not going to happen. So children will not be that interested in online learning, and we we are parents, we are not teachers, right? So they are not going to listen to us as much as they listen to the teachers. So parents need to adjust their expectations of online learning as well and understand that. This is a difficult situation for the children as well. And setting limits around screen time is very important. So the uh, American, American Pediatric Association has uh, said that there should be no screens. So uh, under any screen time, like laptop, iPhone, any sort of TV screen for children under 18 months of age. So most of parents, they think that they put, uh, to young children, they put the TV thinking that the child will learn. But uh, they have found evidence that children under two years, they are not capable to learn from screens. They le learn based through social interactions. And for young children, it can actually cause impairment in social, emotional development and speech delay. So because of that, screens are not recommended for children under 18 months. And for uh, children from 18 months to five years, not more than one hour per day. And from five to 12 years, not more than two hours per day. In older adolescents, like in uh, young adolescents, uh, it's easy to put uh, limits around time, but for the old adolescents like 16, 17, 18, if you try to set limits that are too strict, they are more likely to rebel against you and 
I do it anyway. So what they recommend is for all adolescents have an open conversation. The dangers of uh, online uh, environments and sort of come to an agreement about the screen time. And again, when the child is doing online learning, keep the screens in common areas. Don't let the child take the uh, laptop or the phone to the room. Keep in a common area so that the parents or whoever is at home is able to see what the child is doing. And uh, don't allow the child to take the screen, or the laptop or phone or whatever to bed with you. Because, uh, and the boy stop them from using the screens one hour prior to bedtime because a lot of the sleep disturbances that we like that was seen during the pandemic is attributed to the excessive screen time. So screens uh, can uh, sort of the blue light from the screens it interferes with the melatonin secretion and that can cause sleep disturbances and also like the content they watch if it's very emotionally arousing that also can uh, close to bedtime if they watch something like that that cause can cause them to have problems with sleep. And uh, then it's important that the parents are familiar with the internet themselves. So a lot of the time, the parents we find, they don't know what the children are up to on the phones because they are not technologically competent. So children are easily able to fool them and do what they want to do. So it, as parents, it's important that parents get competent in technology as much as possible and use apps. There are apps to uh, monitor the content, apps, apps to sort of monitor the time the child is on the uh, internet and also if the parents can liaise with the service provider to block inappropriate content. So these advice you can give all the parents. And it's the parents themselves need to take measures to manage their own stress. So the, the study is done during the pandemic. It has found that parents are more stressed during the pandemic and the stress was associated with more uh, use of physical punishment, uh, more use of harsh punishment, verbal hostility and uh, increased criticism and emotional withdrawal uh, from the child. So unless the parent uh, manage their stress, uh, this stress can affect the child's mental health. So it's important parent takes measures to seek help if needed to manage their own stress. And again, parents need to be aware of any changes that may indicate a mental health problem in the child. So it's important that you educate the parents. So what can the teachers do when the school starts, when children go back to school? So children have been away from school for a long period. So they have been without any routine, any structure for a long period. So it will be very difficult for them to get back to a routine. So children, teachers should uh, understand that and allow some provision for that. And they may need to uh, spend more time teaching children rules and expectations than before because the children have now all forgotten it. And the teachers should give an opportunity for the children to talk about uh, their experiences during the pandemic. So one way is good for ventilation. The other thing is the teachers can then identify who, what are the, who are the children who have had very negative experiences during the pandemic. And if they identify that, they can keep an eye on these children to see whether there is any uh, problem. And they have to keep time to play and focus on play uh, initially, then covering the syllabus. And uh, those, uh, they should sort of revise the curriculum that is that was done online for the very good of the students who did not have access to this uh, during online learning. And what can healthcare providers do? So studies done before the pandemic, they have found that about 20 to 25 percent of the children present in the primary care of pediatricians, they have psychological problems. And they have uh, 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 hypothesized that this, that this rate may be even higher now after the pandemic. So it's very important that uh, all healthcare workers, primary uh, care workers and pediatricians uh, be aware of the signs of psychological problems in children. So I just thought, uh, I just briefly talk about uh, the signs of depression because uh, most of us think that uh, a depressed child would be just crying and uh, very withdrawn and uh, looking very sad but that is not always the case children often present differently differently than adults so they may they are more likely to present with these kind of depression and aggression so uh, the child who has previously behaved well had no problems at school or no problems with sitting 
suddenly becomes very irritable. They start fighting with their uh, siblings and their classmates. They don't listen to the parents anymore. So that if these sort of behaviors are of recent onset, that is very likely to indicate an underlying depression. And if they have given up activities that they previously enjoyed, and boredom, so they often complain of boredom when they are feeling depressed because uh, that shows that they don't uh, enjoy the activities that they previously enjoyed. So I'm sure all children complain of boredom at some point of their life, that's common. But if they persistently complain of boredom, that they are not able to enjoy the activities that they previously enjoyed, that again can be a sign of depression as well as laziness. So parents often come and tell us that this child used to uh, help me in cleaning, uh, used to uh, sort of help his brother with uh, his activities. Now he's become so lazy, he's not doing anything, right? So there are enough and more children who are never doing those things, who are never involved in housework and all that, but that's okay. But if, it, if this child is someone who has previously done these things, and now suddenly it's not having motivation for any of these things, that could be depression. And if they've lost motivation for studies and uh, sort of uh, their school performance has gone down, they're having a lot of headaches, abdominal pain, those symptoms, and threats of self-harm, uh, all of these may indicate depression. And anxiety again, fearfulness, worrying, and clinginess. So they used to be able to go uh, to the other room without the mother, now without the mother, so those, that sort of clingy behavior may indicate anxiety or avoiding cases of people due to fear and somatic symptoms, so all may be due to anxiety. So at, as primary care workers or pediatricians, uh, we need to be vigilant about this change of behavior and it's good if you can routinely ask for these, uh, these symptoms, these changes of sleep, appetite and behavior during the primary uh, consultations. And we can advise the parents to have regular sleep care cycles about the rules around screen time and promoting physical activity. So if you want to more read more about that, or if you want to direct the parents to read more about it, there are enough and more resources from the UNICEF and the WHO about um, how to parent during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, how to talk to children about the pandemic, about keeping routines and all these things. And if anyone wants resources from the local language, the Sri Lanka College of Child and Adolescent Psychiatrists and the Sri Lanka College of Psychiatrists, we have developed a lot of free uh, resources, videos and other material that can be of access to the websites and YouTube. Right, and uh, finally, so if, if you find any child or parent with problems and they are not willing to uh, go to a mental health service, you can always refer them to the mental health hotline 1926 which is the hotline of the National Institute of Mental Health. And if there is any abuse going on, you can report to 1929, the National Child Protection Authority hotline, and they also have an app where you can send a message about uh, any form of abuse. And if you think that they need help, further help, you can refer to psychiatric clinics at all government hospitals. And also, if you feel that they only need a bit of counseling and help, uh, you can refer to your own PSO or middle PSO in most government hospitals. Right. Um, thank you very much and thank you, Madam, for inviting me to uh, talk at this occasion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. It was like this relevant for all of us at some point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Good morning and uh, thank you very much to the Lama South Asian Hospital Clinical Society for the opportunity. Um, well, next um, 20 minutes or half an hour, I'm going to take you through this uh, presentation on Iomectin use in COVID-19 patients. So uh, let me get started straight away. Right. So the problem we have is whether iomectin has any impact or effect, or what is the effectiveness of iomectin in the treatment of COVID-19? That is the question that we all have. Well, some of us use it. Some, I know certain consultants, uh, they weekly dose, they take iomectin. So, but still we are in a bit of a gray area. So I'm trying to sort of give you some evidence for you all to digest and then take your own decision. I'm not going to give you an answer at the end of the lecture, but I'm rather going to give you present the data available so that you can uh, formulate your own uh, thinking. Uh, if you're a fan of iomectin or if you're against it, you can see the both sides of the story. So moving on, this is the outline of the lecture, uh, just to signpost you. And so we'll start with what is iomectin. Now, uh, obviously, uh, I'm talking about this because this is an antibiotic medication. Uh, well, it was uh, uh, the it is a sort of a derivative of uh, uh, something called avamectin, which is an uh, which has a broad spectrum antibacterial effects. This was uh, initially detected by uh, one of the Japanese uh, professors when he examined soil. He detected this bacteria first, the streptomycin bacteria. And when at that time they had a collaboration with the USA Merck company. So, what he did was he contacted Merck, and then uh, Professor Campbell uh, was uh, at the other end uh, in the US. And so, he is the one who fermented the bacteria and extracted this avamectin. And from that, they uh, modi uh, sort of modified it and prepared the iomectin. So for this, now the iomectin is being used for parasitic medic, uh, for parasitic infections worldwide, and uh, uh, this was initially uh, used for in animals rather than in humans. That's why people talk about is this a host drug or something like that. So initially in 1980s, they initially started off uh, using it for animals, and later on, after about six seven years later, it was registered for human use. The formulations were made for human use. Okay, so when they use it, uh, they started using it for a disease called uh, river blindness or onchocerciasis. That's very commonly seen in African region. It causes river blindness in the humans, uh, those who get it. And uh, it is supposed to be, you know, it's considered as uh, one of the few disease uh, causes, the leading causes of blindness, which is treatable. So this particular iomectin was used for that. And what happened was the countries in Africa, they actually got rid of the disease. This, this is just mostly eliminated and it's only remaining in few pockets now. So for this achievement, these two uh, gentlemen were given Nobel Prize in 2015. Even though it detected uh, about two, two, two and a half decades ago, they were given the Nobel Prize because they, this drug led to elimination of a disease, which, is, which was a public health problem and as well as it was a kind of you know debilitating disease which affect the eyesight of the people so they got the price of course they had to uh, share the price uh, with another researcher who uh, invented the uh, anti-malarial drug so but uh, basically they won the Nobel prize right so since i said it is used for uh, uh, parasitic infections uh, just to tell you the indications in parasitology we use it for treatment of nematode infections, as well as to treat uh, ectoparasitic infections. Some of these are actually off the label, like for filariasis, in the sense of the filariasis that we have. There's another filariasis in other countries, a different category than what we know. That uh, this is off the label use is there. And as well as there are other skin manifestations for which they use our electric, which are all off the label things. These are the, uh, the meant uh, for treatment. So people, mostly I have heard people talk about side effects and contraindications, uh, 
like scary stories are being uh, told. But in fact, if you check the indication, contraindications, it says yeah, there are no contraindications except for the hypersensitivity, non hypersensitivity to iomectin previously uh, taken. And then when it comes to pregnancy, also they say it is in the pregnancy C category, which means you can weigh the benefits and risks and you can give it uh, with caution. In fact, in Africa, they gave it for everyone about six months of age. So that time, of course, they didn't talk about any side effects. Now, Merck is the company who produced it initially. They had the patency. Then later on, they actually uh, made it off patent. That means they gave it away and started giving free uh, to the African region as a donation in the WHO. So that time, they were talking about safe drug. Where is, uh, they said it's very safe. Uh, if it is not safe, I'm sure they wouldn't have given it to the pregnant mothers or the lactating mothers. Uh, of course, it uh, secretes in the breast milk, but then uh, they have not detected anything uh, beyond that. And uh, I'll talk about the other things, uh, the safety later on. Moving on to the formulations now, these now for COVID 19, they have tested the oral tablets, nasal spray mainly, mainly the oral tablet, and some studies have uh, tested on nasal spray as well. And there are topical medicine, uh, the topical applications have also been tested in few studies. And when you take this tablet orally, it's well absorbed. And uh, you usually say to take it with meals. So maybe we say, uh, then again take the rest of the meal. So it is to be taken with meals. And uh, like other, some of the anti malarial drugs, this has to be, you know, this. Uh, well absorbed uh, if you take it with fatty meal. Okay, so right. So moving on, the other thing people are talking about is they think uh, this can cause neurological uh, manifestations as side effects. Well, this is a protein-bound molecule, so it actually does not cause the blood-brain barrier. So it's quite safe. That is one of the reasons why it is. Uh, we talk about the safety profiling. So moving on to the other safety uh, aspect of it, this is considered extremely safe, and uh, that is, you know, it is. It has been given to billions of people in the African region. If it was not safe, well, now if the company now says they are worried about safety of the drug, if it is so, I think the African region should sue against WHO and the Merck company for giving an unsafe drug to children. And to pregnant mothers, lactating mothers, to entire nation, if it, if they are worried about the safety now, well, and the rare uh, side effects, very rare and very mild. There is a list of side effects which are mostly relevant to the, you know, in Africa. They other than this river blindness, they have this disease called the uh, eye worm, uh, which is uh, called dryasis. So if they have both diseases synchronously, cement. Um, Simultaneously, they can uh, get a put a reaction to that because of the you know suddenly the drug is killing all the parasites and then lo lo loads of antigens are being released to the, the blood. So that can create a um, uh, reaction called massive reaction, which doesn't happen in our country because we don't have that disease in Sri Lanka. And as well as if they take B, C, diethyl, carbamazine, and I mentioned together there can be reactions. There are little drug reactions like um, warfarin action is um, not to be, you know, reduced a little by I and other drugs, of course, can uh, increase the metabolism of I -mectin. Those are very mild, rare ones. Other than that, this is a very well tolerated drug which has been tested by giving 10 times the normal dosage. So, which means they have well. It's a well-tolerated, safe drug to begin with. And uh, before I move on to the action uh, antiviral uh, properties, uh, in parasitic infections, it actually paralyzes the, the body wall and the pharynx. So that's why you know it acts on the parasite rather than on the human. So that's why uh, the side effect profile is very safe and almost minimal. Now, when it takes to uh, you know the, the actually the the parasite, the worm, the nematode dies of starvation rather than the drug killing it because the drug paralyzes the, uh, the body walls and the pharynx so that they cannot move or they cannot consume food so that actually they die of starvation rather than anything else. 
So now I'm going to move on to the, the, the topic uh, per se. That's the evidence for and against in the use of uh, in the use of biomedicine for prevention and treatment both aspects in COVID-19. So moving on uh, now, this is just to start off with, just to give a head start. Uh, these are the, uh, the ones which I have highlighted. The other ones, the main impact, then at uh, properties of the drug which acts on the COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So it has antiviral activity, it has anti-inflammatory activity, and also it has immunomodulatory activities. I'll go into little details or give you evidence, uh, you know, these will be repeated in another few slides. So I'm going to move on to this one. Now, uh, before I present evidence, I want you to, you know, we all come to the same uh, level of understanding when we analyze evidence. Now, there are scientific evidence, there are non-scientific evidence. Non-scientific evidence are mostly nonsense sometimes. But uh, you know, the, the social media carries about 80% of the time they are nonsense rather than non scientific evidence. But then uh, we should not uh, discard them totally because sometimes those non scientific things, the perspectives, opinions, and certain you know, personal clinical experience, uh, anecdotes, those things can drive you to, you know, it will trigger you to think. Uh, uh, beyond that story and you want to test it scientifically and it prove it or disprove it. So those things actually trigger your, your you know, scientific uh, thinking as well. So, you know, it is for us to, you know, take it in a correct uh, way and uh, not to, uh, you know, by heart and follow what the other people are saying. You know, I, I know some of you, you know, if the very uh, uh, sort of uh, known personality or somebody who is very well respected in the field, if they say, okay, give this, you take it uh, as true. But uh, I'm trying to tell you how to analyze your evidence and come to your own conclusion because you, we all are uh, professionally qualified people, we should be able to do it on our own. Okay, right. So now if you look at the hierarchy of scientific evidence, now this uh, bottom of the triangle has this case reports, the perspectives, letters, those things are the, the least scientific type of evidence, but when written by a scientific person or a professional, that can also have some value. That is why it is at the lower bottom of the triangle. And when you go up, you know, from there you get an opinion and then you do it on the bench and then you move to uh, the laboratory, uh, the animal studies, and then you move on to uh, try it on the molecules like, you know, computer models, mathematical models. Likewise, you go up and the randomized controlled trials are in the uh, the systematic uh, reviews and the meta-analysis are at the top of the scientific evidence in the hierarchy. So those are the, actually the best one to look at it when you are looking at uh, looking for some evidence. But since I mentioned about the others, now I'm just going to uh, uh, take you through this uh, the each step of the triangle just to uh, just to show you that there are evidence to support the uh, in uh, for and against. Uh, starting with case reports, now this is one of the things that they uh, started on initially. Um, well, the, the publication came out later, but uh, when it comes to the the um, you know, when it became a hot topic, that is one of these, uh, this is one of the uh, things that uh, sort of triggered off the discussion. Because this one, what uh, happened was uh, this in this nursing care, this care home, they have uh, had uh, scabies in some of the, uh, uh, the residents and they have given iomentine for the scabies. So, but then later on, they have observed that those people didn't get, or rather the incidence among them of COVID was very low. And that uh, observation has led to this uh, story. Uh, this is just a case report. So it is basically lying lower down in the the scientific evidence strength, but then uh, it actually uh, triggers some thought uh, among others. And so people started doing research. Now, while we were running behind the Zoom farm or while we are making fish man and putting on the social media, other people have been doing research. This research, this particular slide, if I put a reference, I should have put about, about 100 references. 
There are so many research, all published in 2020 or 2021, which means that during the lockdown period, they have been very active doing all research. Um, while we, are, we were worrying about finding vegetables and growing bread and all that. Okay, so this is just cluster. I just uh, picked up the viruses that we all are familiar with. Otherwise, there are plenty of other RNA viruses which they have tested. Plus, there are other DNA viruses against which this antiviral properties have been detected and uh, shown. And moving from the lab, the bench to the animal studies, they have uh, shown that it reduces the viral load, it reduces, uh, it prevents uh, organ damage, and it has anti inflammatory and immunomodulatory effects uh, in animals. They have used hamsters and all that and have tested. And then this uh, in silico. In silico means this um, mathematical computer modeling, we call it docking, where they apply the, the, the uh, principle into the computer and see whether there's an impact on it. So it has shown that it has very high binding affinity to uh, SARS CoV virus spike protein, which is very important for entry into the host cell. And these are observational studies. Observational means Say if you're if you're the clinician, if you're the consultant, you see that there are so many patients in, you know, you start realizing that there is some observation, and then you go back to your data and then you write on this is what has happened, and they sort of has have seen uh, some positive impact on COVID-19 patients. Now, even though I am talking now the positive things, don't think that I think ivermectin uh, is effective. I'm just presenting one side of the story and later on I'll come to the other side of the story. Uh, the, now, I'm presenting the data of the ivermectin fans right now. Okay, right. So I said that um, in the hierarchy from um, in that triangle, when you go up, you do clinical trials, which are of very high scientific value. So this diagram, which you which you are seeing, is uh, is called a forest uh, plot. Forest plot is done when you do a meta analysis. Now, those who are not very familiar with these scientific terms, when uh, say all of you all have done research on one topic, and uh, if I want to do a, a systematic review, I look at all your research data and. Uh, then I take all your data, in the sense the published data, and put it together, pre-analyze them, I amalgamate all of your data, and then amalgamate, and the total data is being re-analyzed again to get this result. So I uh, don't worry about not seeing the letters, uh, but um, uh, these are individual research that I'm showing you now. The others are confidence intervals and the number of participants and all that. So if you just uh, look at this part, which is the forest plot, um, you can see that I have drawn a red line in the middle. That means once on this side, I actually favor cybermectin. Once on this side, I'm favoring the control. Okay. So which means now these little, little uh, blocks that you see are the individual results of the, uh, the study results. Uh, this line, horizontal line, represents the, the confidence interval. If it is longer, that study is not so good. If it is shorter, it's good. And the size of the block is based on the case number, case load, the number of participants. So it's, it has no uh, relevance much other than, you know, bigger studies give more conclusive evidence. So when I when somebody puts together all these things and reanalyze, you get this um, crystal uh, shape, uh, uh, structure, which is the cumulative or the, the final event put together the rest of the studies. Okay, so you can see that the, you know, on this side, there are so many studies are favoring myomectin, whereas this side there are only few. Now these are peer review trials, which means they are not uh, uh, peer reviews means uh, now sometimes uh, nowadays we do a uh, Preprint publication. That means before we publish it, uh, we just release the results in a sub abstract manner or a very small write-up as a preprint, which is not a uh, it's not a peer review in the sense no one else has read it before it goes to the preprint. It's just that I think I should put it and though I put it. So those are not really accepted as scientific material, but then that is it's like the 
like you know the the, the you know it's a aura kind of that a paper is coming kind of thing okay so moving on to the randomized control trial now peer review trials this is all together uh, by the time you know february 20th uh, i think is the date uh, so i have taken on that day this particular website of course they are i am an in fan so they do regular meta analysis and they publish results from their they got it so when uh, when we do meta analysis or systematically we put a inclusion criteria say i put uh, this these are the inclusion these are the exclusion and i get only the ones which fit into that inclusion so these randomized control trials uh, they have removed the the bad ones the ones with the methodological flaws and they as you could see that there is not much of a difference of you know this side and this side you know mostly again it, the most of these studies favor um, uh, use of ivermectin uh, in covid-19 patients now when this uh, crystal is longer it is not so good when the crystal is away from the the red line it's good right this is a scatter plot again this is a summative of the same thing that i presented the whole studies you can see that green lumps are all majority of the dots are on the left side favoring ivermectin whereas uh, controls are less in number okay now we come to the other side of the story now there are now those i showed you actually are scientific papers now this is actually a, a perspective or a opinion paper given to the editor you can write letter to the editor if it is very valid they publish it so there are not scientific research but they also have some value in it so this now the other side they say these science the science uh, you know these are there are methodological flaws so it's not acceptable what they say and uh, even the website that i showed you now apart from that website many other websites are also they are you know, they have mentioned the names i remove the names they say these are all misleading clinical evidence and systematic review uh, you know analyzed in a different and the wrong way so that they don't actually depict the correct um, uh, view and this is also a similar one where they say it is not effective right so this is again um, you uh, know the research uh, journal but this is an uh, this is a letter to the editor right so the other people the algorithm fans say some other stories so the other story is that they say now if you look at this timing now the the time that they have received within a one month less than one month time it has approved now in our real life scenarios uh, those who do research we know that if you hear from the editors so quickly that means your article has been rejected by them sooner the better sooner the news you get news is that the negative one generally you know unless it is world class research like uh, rosenelgas i don't think uh, we hear the good news so early so but these most of these uh, articles if you check they have actually public uh, publish uh, publish very quickly so that is one of the criticism done by the other party okay and so these criticism are against certain you know the uh, the scientific evidence and they say application of the drug now usually they say the early the now you know the phase of a uh, covid 19 infection the how it evolves initially the viral application and then it goes to the inflammation and the uh, cytokine storm that range now unless you start the drug at the correct time it won't have if we are targeting the antiviral effect you have to start early so some of the studies they have uh, enrolled patients who within the seven days 10 days when the first Three days is more. Then there is no, uh, you know, there is no uh, you know, your outcome measure and the, your application of the drug is mismatching. And then they talk about small sample size uh, in clinical trials. It's very difficult to uh, you know do higher bigger numbers. But they talk about at least to have more than five hundred. So anything which is below five hundred or there are studies which are with uh, very few numbers less than hundred. So those are being criticized. and some people have taken convenient samples and they have so now when we write a protocol for clinical trial we have certain call things for primary outcome and also we have secondary outcomes these are like your usual research methodology you write the general objective and specific objective likewise we have 
primary outcomes, secondary outcomes. So then we cannot have too many outcomes because when you have a small sample, uh, your sample is going to be divided and your outcome and the, the analysis is going to be not so effective. That is one of the criticism against these studies. And then uh, um, uh, concomitant treatment with others where they have not controlled it, like uh, you know, some other drug which may have has impact is also being taken by the patient. So those are the things. Other thing is in research, every one of our research has some risk of bias, we being biased. So that is being uh, sort of, uh, when we do meta-analysis and systematic reviews, we measure the level of bias. Now that measuring is done, you know, in uh, using various tools, but if you compare these four, um, well, I know you can't see, but these four, of course, uh, they have different, you know, one study say to study A as high risk. To the same study, another group say it is low risk. Likewise, there is no consensus among the meta analysis people as well. And uh, there are methodological errors, like you know, some patients, uh, I'll talk about it later. And then uh, some of the patients have been given very small doses, which are not enough to reach the tissue level and uh, the duration is not enough. And then um, those are the uh, criticism against the, the studies which are favorable for IOMT. Now I'm going to talk about the evidence unfavorable. That means they say there is no effect of IOMT on COVID-19 patients. Now this, this study, uh, if you note the date, this is 18 February, just few days ago, this was published by uh, Malaysian team, um, this um, ITEC trial. Now, when we do clinical trials, we put a kind of a nickname, short name. Now, ours is Ivacog. Likewise, generally, we have a shorter name. The ITEC uh, was published recently. And they say there is no supportive evidence to use IOMT. But it has some uh, certain uh, methodological flaws, I will take talk about it later. Now this study on the other hand is a very good study where they have super methodology and they also say there is no difference in the proportion of PCR positives, right? So, but then if you read the conclusion, the next statement is, well, however, a marked reduction of self-reporting, it has reduced the symptoms of patients and it has reduced the, the viral load. That is the second, third statement that they are making. But the main uh, take home message they say is no difference in the proportion, but they suggest that there is a, seems to be an impact. So, the, now those are the ones which are against evidence. There are so many, I didn't put I just put two, just to tell you that there's evidence for and there's evidence against. Now, there are certain countries between these two groups, and uh, the, one of the main ones now. The ones who are the IOMT in favorable group says, they say that there are so many conflicts in the group who are reporting negative results. Uh, one of the things is uh, conflict of interest. That is, now this Lopez uh, Medina's research has been taken by everybody. Sort of say WHO, every meta-analysis, they have taken this, but actually it is full of uh, methodological errors. They have not looked at the biological clearance, so they have not done any biological assessments. And they have, uh, you know, generally I told you the biometric should be taken with food, but they have asked the patient to take it uh, on empty stomach. And then the, I said it has to be given early to look at the early treatment response in the first three days. And uh, this country now, that uh, particular area is a place where biometric is abundant and everybody is taking. So in that area, she has taken on the group has taken only the iomectin exclusion criteria says iomectin taken five days ago, they were excluded. But then the others now, these people have been taking iomectin, now they are in the control group just because the last five days they have not taken. So those are errors in the system. And uh, when you mess up the study randomization in the middle of a clinical trial, you have to stop the clinical trial because now now. When you say double blind, I don't know what the medicine that I'm giving to the patient, and patient also doesn't know whether the patient is getting placebo or the drug. 
So if there's any mess up and then I get to know, I have to stop. That is usually the ethical norm of uh, clinical trials, which they have not followed. And the other thing is, when we write papers, we just say uh, no conflict of uh, interest uh, because generally we don't. But um, I don't know whether you have ever read uh, the conflict of interest column. Now, this particular studies, they say that they are being paid from the Merck and the Tencent and GSK. They have been actually funded by those particular companies and the study has been designed by the company. Study has been um, analyzed by the company. Study has, uh, just the study group has all, what they have done is just to, uh, you know, give the patients the medicine. And uh, even the consent taking has been done by the company and they have just written the paper. So basically those are very sort of obvious, you can see that something uh, wrong in the process. Would have done it, uh, I mean, I don't know whether intentional or unintentional, whatever the way, they have done it in the wrong hand. And then others criticize that certain studies are designed to fail. You know, they want the negative results because they use in such a way that they take patients who are about seven days, 10 days uh, about ago, uh, they were detected quite a long time ago. So there is no, you know, certain methodologies have been adjusted to get negative results. You can do research to, you know, prove your uh, hypothesis or disprove them. So they have used a way to destroy in their say. And then they uh, uh, profusely uh, accuse WHO as well. They say there are so many studies, they have included only seven out of that seven now. So they have taken that particular study, which I showed you that with a lot of loads of uh, pathological errors, they have taken that as well. And when we come to Merck, uh, now Merck is the one which produced the drug initially. They had the patency and then they gave out the patency which is a cheap drug. And now they don't want to do anything about it. In fact, the University of Oxford is doing a, a, a study called Principal right now, clinical trial. They have no medicine right now, and the Merck company is not ready to make the drug for them. So, and uh, the Japanese professor who uh, invented the, uh, the thing initially had uh, requested Merck to do a collaborative uh, uh, clinical trial, which has been declined by the Merck as well. So, they are not at all interested because they are producing another drug right now. So these conflicts go on, uh, the, the, they say now some of these previous uh, studies, you know, then there are only 5-10 studies, they have approved the drug, these are against WHO. Uh, when there are so many evidence, they are pending the, results, pending the decision. So as uh, these other things, these are all uh, expensive uh, drugs which are being tested. There is only one clinical trial, but these are all approved by the uh, uh, FAD, whereas Iomectin is in the pending state. These are all the Iomectin fan stories, I have to say. Okay, so this is another thing that I just wrote, uh, prepared this table to show you. This Merck company is producing Iomectin uh, used to, and they are now creating a new drug. Now, this drug is being tested. If you look at the, if you compare the two profiles, now this is being given only once a day for five days, this is twice a day for five days, and this has so many anti viral and anti inflammatory and uh, immunomodulatory effects, whereas this actually mutated the RNA code, and that is the action of it. And that actually has led to this fetal harm in pregnant mothers. And so when this drug is given, they, they ask the patient not to get uh, pregnant or, you know, uh, delay the pregnancy and so on and so forth because there's a risk of getting fetal harm. There's nothing in the in the IVMT like that, but uh, the effectiveness is about 68% or you know compared 30% in the uh, molnupiravir, and then uh, still it is given emergency approval, whereas the IVMT is not approved. And one thing to note is the cost. Uh, cost of five days treatment of ivermectin is about $26, whereas the five days course cost about say $112 uh, for them. And uh, that also has been uh, criticized by Harvard University team saying that the cost of production is only just $17. Okay, so the recommendations, everybody say no, basically right now, no one say give it. WHO, FDA, NIH, US, Cochrane reviews, which are the, you know, Cochrane reviews are supposed to be the best of all reviews. So they also say no. 
I'll show you the Cochrane review. This is the Cochrane review results. The authors say based on the very low and low certainty evidence, they are uncertain about the efficacy. They say they, they don't say that there's no efficacy. If you look at the uh, forest plots, uh, you will understand that they are kind of close or crossing to the uh, effectiveness side. Right. So this is being used in many countries. Um, many other countries, I'm not going to name them. So what, uh, so what are we going to do? We are waiting for results of larger studies, uh, hopefully good results, um, I mean, probably um, very good uh, outcomes uh, uh, because they have large number of study participants. And uh, so these research uh, uh, are ongoing and uh, waiting results soon. So uh, in Sri Lanka also, we are also doing a research. Uh, Anand Vikram is uh, the principal investigator and the tri coordinator. We are doing a study and that results will also be available in about the two, three months time. So in summary, there are multiple mechanisms, drug actions have been proven in the research, but we don't know which is, which is affecting the real treatment or prevention. And there's no consensus among any of the organizations. So right now we are in a gray area. We don't know whether to believe it or not. Some people promote it, some people discard it. So it's up to you to you know, look at the evidence and take your decision. Thank you. I invite Professor Asmi Bamhaker to receive the certificate of appreciation. Yeah, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I, I'm not going to take a lot of time. So I will talk about something, a uh, topic which is a little bit odd. Uh, for some of y'all, and some of y'all must be aware about this plastic issue. So today uh, I'll be speaking uh, mainly basically the plastic material that I'm seen by the naked eye from uh, 10 to the power minus 6 to 10 to the power minus 9 from micro to nano level. So basically this plastic that we are putting out uh, without any control are uh, categorized and broken down uh, to a small scale level where we can't see it through the naked eye. So basically, uh, we are for the study purposes, we are dividing this uh, plastic material, the microplastics, into two categories. One is primary, the other one is the secondary. So these uh, images, I think you all are familiar with the recent marine disaster, the express pearl, where a lot of nerds came to our beach. Uh, those are manufactured at the scale of less than 5 millimeter. So those are considered as, as primary microplastics. And you know, in Sri Lankan market also, we do have plastic beads in the toothpaste and also uh, in the shower gels or the uh, scrubbing, uh, scrubbing material. So they have uh, shown and proven that even from one wash, uh, when you are using scrubbing material, the paste wash, at least you are releasing uh, 100,000 to 150,000 plastic nerds or the tiny beads which you can't see uh, to the environment. Now think how much of plastic waste that you have released to the environment. And the second microplastic is now when you throw away a toffee paper or a plastic bottle or a milk packet to the environment, some people will burn that. Uh, now in the environment, it is exposed to the sunlight, there will be radiation, the rain. And sometimes it is getting crushed by the vehicles. So again, these plastic material will broken down uh, to tiny particles less than five millimeter. Anything which is less than five millimeter is considered as microplastic. So now, uh, when we take now the statistical data, less than ten percent of all the plastic waste which are produced worldwide being recycled. That means more than ninety percent being dumped as the landfilling and also burnt out as pure uh, material or just burn them out. So now what, what is the problem with this plastic? 
So I told you that now these tiny plastics, less than five millimeter, will be broken down into micro scale and less to the nano scale, will be washed away uh, in our brains and ultimately come to the river and the sea. So these are microscopic animals that we uh, have in our environment. These are the tiny creatures which are there in the lowest level of our food chain. So they think these plastic materials are they are part of their food. They ingest that. Now these are luminous microscopic uh, uh, images, the fluorescent ones. So you can see the entire GIT tract of this creature is filled. This luminous green color ones are filled by this plastic materials. So what happened here is this is a simple food chain that we have uh, learned during our school time. It will gradually get accumulated in our food cycle. So these tiny creatures will be by a fish. Uh, hundreds of these tiny uh, creatures and hundreds of this number two fish will be by one uh, number three fish. So what will happen is gradually there will be a bioaccumulation in our system because uh, human, as humans we do eat number two as well as number three because we do eat uh, salia, we do eat harmasa, we do eat paramaru or whatever the bigger fish also and also at the same time we eat punisa also. So what will happen is the humans are the end product unless we uh, are being eaten by the tiger or the lion. So we are having a uh, huge accumulation of plastics. So this is another study done in China just to show these films, the whatever the uh, lunch sheets that we are throwing away and the fragments from the plastic bottles and the fibers. This is the, the deadliest uh, problem now we are, which we are facing. Uh, are accumulated at different parts of the fish at the grill or in the intestine. So uh, this is a study conducted uh, by University of Peradeniya and published in 2020 December, where this express pearl marine disaster before this express pearl marine disaster happened. Okay, so they have come out with a you know, this is NSF funded research and the data is available. Anyone who wants to can go to that uh, link and find out. They have mentioned that irrespective of the brand that you buy, okay, irrespective of the brand that you buy, all the table salts are contaminated with microplastics. So now think how much of plastic that we are eating. And this is a WHO report with 120 pages. They have uh, indicated that. In the drinking water, we are having plastic. So this is a study conducted by another set of group, and they have purchased the bottled water, okay, from China, India, Indonesia, and some online uh, platforms also. And every water bottle, depending on the location of the country, they have plastic material inside that drinking water bottle, which we can't see. So uh, they haven't included Sri Lanka. I'm pretty sure the Sri Lanka water bottles will also contain the same. So uh, now the, uh, the thing is now if somebody tells, I don't know how many water bottle owners are here, uh, water bottle company owners. So the, the thing is if somebody tells, okay, my company produces hundred percent microplastic free water, that is totally false because there are microplastic filters that we can buy from the market which are very expensive, even though they use those expensive water bottles and put 100% microplastic free water into that plastic bottle, after some time, that inner layer of that water bottle is going to shed out. So the water will have a dynamic equilibrium uh, between the plastic water bottle and the chemicals and plastic uh, layers will slowly come into the water. So if you really want to have water from a water bottle, uh, it is better to drink and check the manufacturer and drink the water bottles closer to the manufacturer because when you keep it for a long time, more the microplastics are coming into the water. So better not to promote water bottles in many occasions. So via food, it will enter to our system. There are different uh, mechanisms, the tenocytosis, tenocytosis. There are different mechanisms. It will enter through the intestinal villi. It will enter to our GIT tract. In the, into the cells and then into the our portal circulation. Once it is entered to the blood, that, that means it is like you have entered to the highway. So you can exit at any point. Okay. So
So this is the study uh, using the racks. They have uh, incorporated uh, 5 micrometer and 20 micrometer size plastic beads in the rack food and they have given, if you all can see, the luminous green color dots are the things that they have dissected the rack, the liver, kidney and the gut. All the plastic materials that are taken through the intestinal tract have been entered to the circulation and gone to the tissues. This is a zebrafish study just to show you what will happen when you ingest plastic. So, if, uh, this is the intestine of a zebrafish. So, this is the normal intestine. If you can see the entire uh, lining epithelium is in contact. So now pay attention to these arrows. When you ingest microplastic into your GIT tract, it will destroy the intestinal barrier. So intestinal barrier epithelium will get destroyed. So this is the same mechanism which is happening at the right at the uh, right moment in our bodies also. So there are proven evidence this microplastic is going. Now the next inhalation, uh, the method of coming in of microplastics is by inhalation. So by inhalation, these microplastics are coming in uh, and also the particulated matter. So this is a grain of rice. And if you see, this is the fibers that we are talking about, the microplastics, the fibers that are coming out from our clothes when we are washing out. And they have conducted a study for the pregnant rats by letting them inhale the microplastic, not by giving them to eat the microplastic. Only the air is containing microplastics and these pregnant rats are inhaling the microplastics and they have dissected the fetus. If you can pay attention to this, uh, I don't know whether you all see, there are white color dots. Okay, I'm not sure whether those are here. Yeah. If you all can see the white color dots, these are the inhaled microplastics which have gone to the fetus. So the fetus liver, the lung, the brain, heart, and the kidney. So here in the kidney, we have the white color dots. These are the inhaled. The mother has inhaled it. It has grown to the placenta and come to the fetus. So there are evidence that in, the, in human my, uh, placenta also, they have detected these microplastics. So which is happening right at the moment. So, this is the study to show uh, it is happening right at the moment in humans as well. So, that means our children who have not seen, even seen plastics are born with plastics in their body. So, these are the Raman uh, spectrophotometer evidence to show uh, the plastics are there in the body. So, these are the microscopic images, the plastic material that have been found in the placenta. Then the other thing, the plastic material can come into our body through the damaged skin. So now, as you all know, this is the normal anatomy of your skin. Now, the normal intact skin will not do anything. But if you have a damaged skin, the skin can uh, actually invade the plastic material into our body. So now here, this is uh, especially they are targeting on the sebaceous glands and the hair follicles where uh, they have put and applied uh, 40 nanometer uh, microplastic particles, 750 nanometers, and 1500 nanometers. So, as you all can see, this when you become smaller and smaller, the microplastic material it is going through the skin because, as you all know, in, in the Sri Lankan market, we do have makeup with microplastics. So better, uh, better be careful when you're selecting, please read the contents when you're buying it uh, for the next time. So because as you all know, in the ch small children, they do like to eat toothpaste. It's a habit of children. So better when you're buying the next, uh, the toothpaste next time, read the instruction or the contents, make sure that it is, there are no beads Right, even though they are biodegradable beads, that's all right, but make sure that uh, that beads are not plastic. So, what happens when the plastic comes into our body? 
So these are electro microscopic initials. So this is the plastic material, and this plastic material can absorb a lot of plasma proteins and form a corona. So this is the corona formation will be there in our body. So there is a uh, evidence to show the nanoplastic particles which are in our body will form a soft corona and a hard corona around this plastic particle. And those uh, plastic particles will uh, interact. They will produce free radicals. That free radicals will destroy the DNA molecules. And also it will break down and another set of uh, smaller molecules will be formed. And it is like a vicious cycle when you enter microplastics into your body. So why this plastic material is so bad? Because this plastic material is like a magnet. So when they are in the environment, they are very uh, famous and they like to absorb whatever the chemical waste that are there in the environment, like heavy metals, whatever the other hydrocarbon chemical uh, metals, which are there in the environment. So longer the duration that they stay in the environment, we don't know at which point this particular microparticle enters to our body. Sometimes today at this moment, I might be ingesting a microplastic particle which has been there for in, in, in the environment for nearly 10 years. We don't know that. So longer the duration, longer the accumulation of uh, the chemicals in that particular uh, plastic material. Not only uh, these plastic material can uh, absorb all these chemicals, the plastic material, they in the manufacture level, they use heavy metals to get some different properties. Like they are using lead mercury to get some heat properties or the colors and the, the, they use bisphenol lead, especially in these uh, plastic bottles, water bottles. So it is very harmful. So what will happen here is now once you enter this microplastic into your body, now it is in your blood circulation. So it totally depends. Now we know when you uh, smoke cigarette, definitely there will be lung cancer. Okay, so it is a uh, known fact. But in this microplastic, once you enter this plastic material into your intestine, now it is in your blood. So some in certain people it will go and deposit, majority will go and deposit in your brain. Some people it will deposit in your breast. Some people it will be depositing in your liver. So we never know at which point. So in Time to time, lot of people. Some people will come up, with, come out with chronic kidney disease. Some people will come out liver disease. Come out, some will come with colonic disease. So it is a multi-system. Uh, it will affect your entire body. So how much are we eating? So there is, uh, there are evidence to show, irrespective of your gender and irrespective of your age. Okay, so inhalation via the seafood, by the bottled water, by the sugar, and the tap water, the alcohol, the beer we take, the salt, and the honey. Even from the bee honey, these plastic materials are coming in because up to that level of the environment is contained. Okay, so they have uh, found out uh, what sort of a plastic is there in that contaminated uh, material. So, as I told you all in the beginning, the fibers, the microplastic fibers, the deadliest thing is your fibers. It is some of the clothes uh, when you are washing, they are releasing millions and millions of uh, clothes, uh, the fibers to the environment. So, majority in any material, the via air, alcohol, water, all the fibers are coming out. So, how much are they eating? So, per week, they have roughly calculated and adult will eat at least 5 grams of plastic per week. That means that's the size of your ATM card. Okay. So it depends, totally depends on how much of your pollution and what, side, what type of environment that you live and what sort of uh, food that you take. Okay. So by the next presidential election, they are pre uh, predicting for one metric ton of uh, one metric ton of plastic will be there for each three metric ton of fish that they catch in the Indian Oceans. So up to now, up to that level, we are polluted and contaminated. So why this is important in COVID? So I hope that you all have seen this uh, common uh, uh, picture the, from Ocean Asia. So 
when you are releasing this uh, the face mask and the pp without any control to the environment or when we are disposing it right so these uh, masks can simply release microfibers and on plastic material they have shown that this covid virus can survive at least up to 72 hours so in the morning person elika mentioned now it's there's a human to human transmission and there's a animal reservoir also now i will let there is a plastic reservoir also for this covid so this is the unseen part of the same disaster so it is stable now now it has proven uh, the latest research work is going on uh, it has proven that uh, the covid virus can stay on plastic material for several hours and so this will absorb that means it will stick on the surface of the plastic material the fibers that are there on your mask which will come out so then they will found out they will make when they are in the environment they will form an eco corona the corona that means i showed you all in the previous day. and the most uh, problem is in the fibers that the research, the research they have found out the polyester is the most uh, abundant fiber type which is there on our pp so what they have done is they have done a real time pcr on the uh, nucleocapsid protein and also the enveloped protein of the covid so now have a look at this chart so this red color the now a and b and c means the three sites that they have obtained the samples the air samples so now as you all can see there are microplastic fibers and microplastic particles uh, present up to this level and at each level from the real time pcr they have detected this nucleocapsid protein as well as the envelope protein of the covid virus is present on these microplastic fibers so that means so now this is a hypothesis now they are going to bring up in future so that is the one reason where it start from china and within two or three days it has spread to the europe then in the few seconds it has spread to the england uh, before human have gone to the, those particular reasons this is another hypothesis they are coming up this is one mode of transmission so the plastic is going to be the next vector of the microorganisms so they have found out the linear correlation this covid virus and the plastic material so the who also have uh, shown that there is a microplastic is uh, coming with the medical waste uh will transmit the covid 19 so these are the evidence and also uh there are particulate matter uh, in in our environment the dust particles and everything so there are covid rna have been detected on this uh, particulate matter this particulate matter uh, is a broad term umbrella term which also contain microplastics okay so depending on the size the uh, 10 micrometer or 2.5 micrometer depending on the size there are things so with this plastic pollution a new word came to the world plastic uh, plastic sphere in 2003 where the man made uh, environments are there the plastic environment and the other sea creatures or the marine ecosystems will come and start living on them so that is not the problem now the problem comes when the microorganisms go and start living on those plastic sphere so there are plenty of proven evidence there are bacterial and the fungal pores which will transmit from one country one continent to the next continent there are evidence these are electron microscopic evidence to show on the plastic sphere there are grown bacteria and the fungus still they are working on the uh, covid virus since it is no one so on the whatever the food packing materials that we are throwing away the reform boxes i am very happy to say this cardboard box uh, when you are providing food it's a very good concept so whatever the uh, whatever the reform boxes that you are throwing away lunch boxes the plastic packing materials will be the ideal platform to transmit this uh, pathogens from one continent to another so as you all can see how much of uh, antibiotic resistance is there from the bacteria that have been colonized uh, from uh, the study so nearly certain uh, uh, for that certain antibiotics there are nearly 
hundred percent of antimicrobial resistance. So, if you develop the antimicrobial resistance in one continent through this uh, seawater, the bacteria will quickly evolve their DNA and uh, change and adapt to the environment. And that, when you watched, I will show you an image uh, later how these uh, plastic materials are washed away from one continent to another. This will easily spread this antimicrobial resistance. It has already been proven. So this is the mismanaged plastic is the problem that we are facing now. Ultimately, it will go to the river and the sea. So it is our duty as medical people to educate our patients in whenever we discharge them from hospital or from the clinics. Uh, when they, whenever we encounter, educate them uh, to uh, think about and not to pollute the environment. This is the unseen side of the same disaster. So uh, when we are coming from the last item, now this is the air quality index, which is done in Sri Lanka. So as you can see in 2020, when we are under lockdown, we had a very good environmental condition and during the Delta uh, spread also, we had a lockdown and we had a uh, good environmental conditions. But as you can see in 2022, we had red color, Right? These are not good for uh, human health. And this is just to show you how these plastic spheres are coming to our country. This is Kokilai, where I went uh, for a beach cleaning project with Sri Lanka Air Force. So, as you all can pay attention to these letters on these bottles, these are not the bottles which are used in Sri Lanka. So, with the current uh, sea water, it has come to Sri Lanka. So, this book will be out. Uh, uh, very soon, with the collaboration of Environmental Ministry and the Medical Association, uh, to educate the general public about this uh, problem. So we know only the tip of the iceberg, but uh, the things that we don't know is much more. And also, uh, we have to reduce, reuse, and recycle at the same time. Refuse, rethink, and redesign to re recycle these plastics. Otherwise, the environment will tell. Thank you for all the support. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I call upon Dr. Sajit Singh to receive the certificate of appreciation. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the main program for the day. Uh, there are many who deserve praise in the success of this event and to acknowledge their efforts and contributions, I would like to call upon Dr. Sandrawan Ulimis Herege, Secretary of the Clinical Society of Columbus Art Teaching Hospital, to propose a word of thanks. Uh, dear all consultants, all the speakers, and all my colleagues, uh, it's my pleasure to express my sincere gratitude to the people who have come here and uh, participating and making this event a success. First, I would like to uh, give a big thank to SLMA for the first time uh, being here and joining hands with us to have a clinical meeting first ever in Hallu. Uh, uh, then I would like to express my sincere gratitude to all the guest speakers who did a fantastic job here, uh, giving delivering uh, interesting series of interesting lectures and being here at this location. And uh, I would uh, like to thank our president, Dr. Ram Perema and the team. Uh, without uh, them, the event won't be in this success. And the administration, our director, and the uh, IT team who was here throughout the event uh, to succeed in this virtual meeting. Uh, I thank all of you. And it's my duty to thank the uh, sponsors who gave us the economical support and funding, Lanka Hospitals, uh, to make this event a success. Uh, and Ranjan and the team who are here in this uh, auditorium, the uh, team who is managing this, I would like to thank all. And at last, uh, all the participants who are here uh, to make this event a success, gain knowledge. And I would like to uh, let you know that we are looking forward to have such meetings in future uh, to widen the knowledge uh, through this uh, joint SMA and our clinical society. Thank you all for being here. Thanks.
That wraps up the proceedings for the day, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, as you leave, please collect your CPD certificates at the registration counter along with your lunch. Have a good day.